should be noted that not only women and girls, but also men, boys, and the elderly are vulnerable to sexual violence, often intentionally used as a weapon of war. One in, one in the 10 women has experienced sexual violence since the age of 15, and one in 20 has been raped, according to the European Union Agency of Fundamental Rights. Sexual violence remains an underreported, underaddressed issue. Survivors often hesitate to seek support due to concerns about anonymity, potential retraumatization, and fear of blame. The true extent of this problem is not known yet, and these crimes often go underreported. While awareness of sexual violence, including the conflict zones, is growing, states still lack an effective response to address the problem and combat impunity, to achieve a historic turnaround in the fight against sexual violence, especially in conflict zones, we must continue our efforts. Our response should prioritize caring for survivors and addressing their needs, ensuring that we reach those that are still silent. Addressing the root causes of violence is essential. Sexual violence is a result of gender inequality, patriarchal cultural norms, unequal power relations, and gender stereotypes as well. It might be beneficial to consider a change in practice where, in contrast to the current approach, women are invited to participate in state negotiating groups for conflict resolution, adhering to the principle of gender equality. We must act systematically, focus on prevention, protection, legal accountability, integrated, pol pol integrated pol policy development, cooperation between authorities and countries, and the dissemination of best practices. We need to take preventive measures and educate societies. Effective sex education in education systems, activist campaigns, are one way of changing social norms. Strengthening justice systems is crucial, and we need more effective ways to break down the walls of silence so that survivors can speak out, revealing the true extent of sexual violence. Dear all, in the first session of today's discussion, we aim to de uh, delve deeper into the national situation, listening to representatives from non-governmental organizations and exchanging experiences with colleagues from Latvia, Estonia, and Poland. Thank you, all dear, dear, dear colleagues, for joining us today. Sexual violence in the context of war it is a form of military aggression. In the second session, we will focus on the issue of sexual violence in the context of war in Ukraine, with presentations from our dear friends from Ukraine, civil society representative, insights from UN special representative, and contributions from our neighboring countries. It is worthwhile to coordinate our efforts and work together to strengthen our positions in the fight against sexual and gender-based violence hum and human trafficking, especially in the context of military con conflicts. Sharing best practices can help restore survivors' faith in justice and ensure that perpetrators ultimately face accountability for their crimes. I believe that our discussion today will serve as a regional forum and contribute to further strengthening cooperation in the fight against sexual violence, supporting survivors in conflict, and working towards sustainable solutions for conflicts and crises. Thank you all for attending and thank you all for attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Minister, Madam Special uh, Representative, uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I feel honored to speak uh, at uh, the opening of this important event and I would like to take uh, from where the minister, uh, minister left. Despite the international efforts to combat uh, gender-based and sexual violence, it still remains widespread. Armed conflicts uh, creates a, a context in which sexual violence happens on the large scale and is particularly difficult to hold the perpetrators to account and to provide relief to victims. 
In conflict, sexual and gender-based uh, violence is often used as a weapon uh, of the war to humiliate, intimidate, terrorize population in conquered areas. As a woman myself, I feel uh, very strong about international or internal conflict disproportionately affecting women and girls. And I am often uh, shocked by victims and witnesses' accounts of the acts of violence committed by security or military forces of authoritarian regimes and brutal foreign invaders. That is why also from my very personal perspective, the special representative mandate carried with such a dis uh, distinction by Ms. Pramila Patton uh, is so extremely important. Thank you, Ms. Patton, for being so passionate, principled, and uh, vocal about your difficult uh, job. And thank you uh, for traveling all the way to Lithuania to, uh, to, to, to share your insights uh, with us. Almost 20 months ago, Russia started a particular brutal war of aggression against Ukraine, causing geopolitical shock, but also humanitarian and human rights uh, catastrophe over the far-reaching consequences around the globe. With unthinkable brutality and cruelty, Russia's armed forces tortures, rape, and imprison, and sexually exploit women and girls as well boys and men in temporary occupied territories, deport Russian children for re-education in pursuit of uh, genocidal aims. Mass-scale sexual and gender-based violence is one of the characteristic features of the brutal aggression. In this war, Russian politicians and troops have committed the whole area of war crimes and other grave uh, violations of international law. The United Nations Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine has documented hundreds and hundreds of cases uh, of conflict-related sexual violence affecting c uh, uh, civilians and prisoners of war, while the, rim, uh, while the real number is undoubtedly even higher. The UN Commission of Inquiry has confirmed systemic violation of human rights, including rape, with, uh, which has been used as a weapon of war against women who in any case bear brunt of conflict. Uh, these terrifying acts committed by Russian armed forces include torture uh, methods such as electrocution, beating, burns, forced nudity and rape, including gang rape. The victims range from young children to elderly, with the perpetrators sometimes raping victims in the presence of their family members. Moa, Russia's attack on hospitals hinders the access uh, to services for managing aftermaths of the sexual violence. In this important, uh, and it's very important that situation in the occupied uh, parts of Ukraine will be focus of one of the discussions here today in the event. Unfortunately, conflict-related sexual violence occurs widely. For instance, only a few days ago, we saw Hamas terrorists using the same tactics of abduction and rape against Israeli women as Russian forces in Ukraine. The international community must consistently seek for zero tolerance to gender-based and sexual violence in conflicts. Accountability for all atrocities must be unavoidable. We will use all our existing institutions, instruments, and even create new ones like Special International Tribunal for Crimes of Aggression to guarantee it. But justice should not remain limited to accountability of perpetrators. My heart goes out for and first and foremost to the survivors uh, who need our empathy, uh, help and redress. Our global community, international and national institutions will not be much worse unless we manage to enable survivors of sexual and other kinds of violence to get consol uh, consolation and access to services and livelihood, to turn the page, to move on, and to fully reintegrate in society. And I trust this will be another theme and topic for the, today's discussion. So I wish you all a very insightful debate 
and thanks for joining us. Ačiū Jevita, o dabar paprašysiu Pramilo Spatę, jungtinių tautų specialiosios įgaliotinio seksualinio smurto konfliktų metu klausimais pasakyti. Pramila, please, your opening speech now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, allow me to start by thanking the government of Lithuania for uh, the invitation, for its uh, steadfast uh, political and financial support to my mandate, but also for organizing uh, this event, which gives us an opportunity to reflect uh, on the mandate, uh, which is a, a fairly new mandate, a, a young mandate, uh, only uh, established uh, in 2009, but also to then during the round table to focus on the situation in, uh, uh, in, in Ukraine, which is of uh, a situation of concern to, uh, to all of us. Uh, I just want to commend the government of uh, Lithuania for being a powerful voice in the Security Council, and I had the pleasure of, of, of uh, I have the pleasure of working very closely with, uh, with uh, uh, the government of Lithuania, and you have an excellent permanent representative in, uh, uh, in New York. Uh, but it is, I must say, that uh, uh, I have been in office for just over six years now, and uh, the collaboration with uh, regional partners uh, representing the Baltic states ha uh, have also uh, been extremely good and I'm extremely grateful for that for that support uh, and, I'm, and I'm very happy to say that uh, last December um, Lithuania has become our, our newest donor to the UN action uh, window of the conflict related sexual violence uh, multi-partner trust fund which uh, minister the minister for social security uh, 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 mentioned uh, i would also like to commend lithuania's uh, leading role in providing support to survivors of uh, conflict related sexual violence in ukraine and to those who have sought and found refuge uh, here uh, following uh, russia's brutal aggression uh, of of their homeland and, and I think today's conference is, uh, is, is a model to be, to be followed in the, in the region because it really reflects the critical challenge that we face uh, in preventing the occurrence and recurrence of sexual violence uh, with each new wave of, of, of warfare and, and connecting survivors with services and redress. And Minister just mentioned the, the, the situation we are all uh, living right now, uh, watching uh, the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian crisis unfolding and reports of sexual uh, violence surfacing. Uh, this is this is really vital to the credibility of the multilateral system and rules-based international order that that we we do not uh, uh, turn a blind eye to to it and of the ex, I must say existential importance to civilians and and communities in countless war-torn corners of the world and and my role uh, my mandate was created precisely. Uh, to amplify the voices of these uh, invisible survivors. The use of rape as a tactic of war, torture, re political repression and terror uh, has been one of, of the most hidden crimes in, in history. And it has rightly been called one of the world's least condemned uh, crime, of, uh, crime of war, due to the chronic uh, underreporting arising from fear of reprisal, profound uh, trauma, uh, inadequate legal protection, lack of tailored support services, and often the, the absence of capacity, political will, and resources to, to, uh, to, to respond. There's also profound shame uh, and also fear of, uh, of, of rejection. And I, I always uh, remember that lady uh, I met in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 2017, uh, she walked up to me and she was in her 60s and she, she walked up to me and she told me she had just reported uh, the sexual violence that uh, she went through. And she, she was uh, 
in intense trauma. You could feel the pain. And she, then she, she asked me, she said, do you want to know why uh, I only reported 23 years later and the government of Bosnia is, is accusing me of wanting to benefit from a pension? Uh, I looked at her and she said, you know, my husband just died a month ago. And the first thing I, I feel like doing is to relieve myself from that burden. Because if I had mentioned it to my husband, I would have lost him. I would have lost my, my children. So this, this uh, was the case uh, in the context of Bosnia, but it has not changed. It, it's still very much the case. And later on during the round table, as we discuss uh, the situation of, of Ukraine, because I have been twice uh, to Ukraine last year in May and this year in March, uh, I'll, 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 I'll speak more to the situation of, of uh, survivors of sexual violence in, uh, in, in Ukraine. It's true that conflict weakens national institutions, uh, often leaving powerful perpetrators such as military officers or heavily armed militia beyond the reach of uh, the rule of law. But there's also harmful social norms and cul cultural conditioning that have led to victims being, being blamed, shamed and stigmatized. Hence, perpetrating uh, the, the silence that has made rape war's ultimate secret weapon. And, and, and for too long, uh, I think that these crimes have been considered unspeakable, unprintable, and therefore unpunishable. I don't think event like this one happened 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, or 40 years ago. So the minister mentioned uh, the annual report of the Secretary General. My, my office compiles the annual report of the Secretary General on conflict-related sexual violence, which, uh, which is the only historical record of the prevalence of sexual violence. And, and, and this, these annual uh, reports, which, uh, which are debated every year before the Security Council, have really helped to, to build a public a historical record of these crimes and the parties responsible. And in this way, my office is working to really give rape uh, its history uh, in order to deny it a, a future. And the latest uh, annual report debated at the Security Council uh, on the 14th of July, unfortunately, again, paints a very grim picture of the situation across 20 uh, diverse conflict affected countries. It, it does not purport to, uh, uh, to show the, the actual prevalence, but it's more about trends and patterns because we have a very uh, high threshold of verification of cases. So we, uh, I can only transmit to the Security Council UN verified data. So we were able to verify 2,455 cases committed in the case of 2022 with 94% of them targeting women and girls, as the minister said. But what humanitarians uh, on the ground in the field tell us is that the, they estimate that, that for every survivor who comes forward, there's at least 10 to 20 uh, who, never, who are ne never able to reach a health clinic or service provider and, and never report. And, and just to give you, picture uh, of, of the kind of when we talk about sexual violence, what we are talking about. And, and I mentioned some of these cases recently before, uh, before the Security Council to impress on them the, the severity of, of this crime, of this heinous crime, because unfortunately, headlines fade uh, and, and having been in this mandate for six years, what I see is that uh, uh, nothing shocks anyone any, anymore. So uh, I have to bring these cases to the attention of the Security Council. And I cited a few cases. The case of a woman in Northern Ethiopia in Tigray, a young woman who was raped by 27 Ethiopian and Eritrean soldiers. And, and the, the, the war in Ethiopia, which broke out in 2020, uh, has been uh, one of the uh, most brutal uh, uh, 
war uh, and a recent uh, independent uh, commission of inquiry found, found that at, there has been at least 10,000 victims of conflict related sexual violence uh, and many survivors uh, have actually contracted HIV as a result of the rape and of course now face a lifetime of stigma and health challenges. Uh, when I was in Ukraine uh, this March, uh, it was brought to my attention that a four year old girl was raped by a Russian soldier in front of her parents. And there was a 12 year old girl who was raped by several Russian soldiers and who was pregnant. Uh, and these cases were brought to my attention, not only by the prosecutor general himself, but by the uh, deputy prime minister and the first lady. Uh, in the Central African Republic, uh, a woman was raped to death by members of an armed group who accused her of having a relationship with a member of the national armed forces. Uh, in Iraq, hundreds of female Yazidi survivors who returned from Daesh captivity remain in, in displacement site, grappling with uh, chronic health and socioeconomic challenges. Children born of rape are still unable to obtain birth registration and identity documents, as Iraqi law requires proof of paternity. And that's a reality in, 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 in many conflict affected countries. Uh, in Myanmar, women political activists who protested uh, the military coup have been sexually assaulted as a form of reprisal to silence their dissent. And increasingly, we are seeing how sexual violence as a tactic of war is also being used as a tactic of political re uh, repression uh, in the context of elections or, 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 or coup. In Haiti, uh, situation is dire, and I will really have to go to, uh, in the next few weeks, I will have to go to Haiti. Women have been raped by gang members in front of their children after witnessing the execution of their husband. Many victims are forced in broad daylight out of their vehicles and, 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 and raped at, at gunpoint. And it's, uh, they, they are robbed, they are, they are, they are gang raped with total impunity. And, and I don't know whether you are following the news uh, on, on, on Haiti, where there is now a Security Council resolution that has recommended that a, a, a multinational security uh, mission be, be deployed. And, and the government of Kenya has agreed to deploy uh, uh, along with uh, two other countries in in uh, in the Caribbean, uh, so these I, I could go on and give you example because I do. Only this year I went to Colombia, then Ukraine. Uh, I was in the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. I was in South Sudan and and uh, Sudan, and I'm going to Central African Republic in two weeks' time. Uh, and I can I can give you many many uh, more examples, but these incidents really form part of the long litany of battles fought on the bodies of women and girls. And 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 I think it's good for you to to remember that it is in the name of these victims and survivors that we gather here uh, to find ways to ensure a more robust uh, and effective system of prevention, protection, and assistance. As we focus on Ukraine, but I think Ukraine is gonna be a litmus test because I, I see Ukraine as, as, as a paradigm. And, and I see uh, everywhere I hear uh, that other conflict countries do not get the attention that Ukraine is receiving. But I, I, I always tell everyone that, that Ukraine is a litmus test. If we get it right for Ukraine, then we have a chance of, of uh, uh, moving the needle uh, in terms of the other countries. Uh, so that for me, the, the lived experience of survivors must really uh, shape the global search for, for, uh, for solution. And, and the minister mentioned uh, the situation in Israel and pa Palestine, and, and we, are, we are at a moment of great global turbulence. I mean, like, I don't know if you know, we, are, we have the highest number of conflicts since World War II. Uh, level uh, 
record levels of forced displacement uh, and, and, and a refugee crisis uh, reaching a record high of 110 million displaced persons globally. Uh, increased militarization, backlash on gender equality, an epidemic of coup in Africa and elsewhere that have really turned the clock uh, uh, backward uh, on women's rights. Imagine the situation uh, as we speak in Afghanistan or, or Iran or Yemen. And, uh, and against this backdrop, trend, trend lines for conflict-related sexual violence uh, continue to worsen. And, and uh, I see new threats emerging that have largely, from the largely ungoverned digital space. Uh, I see more climate-driven displacement uh, and insecurity, which uh, actually exacerbate uh, competition for scarce resources. I see increasing intercommunal violence, uh, including uh, sexual violence. So we really have to reflect on uh, whether we can allow the plight and rights uh, of sexual violence survivors to be eclipsed. Uh, beneath the shadow of, of these deepening global uh, uh, global uh, crisis, uh, the uh, in in I just came back from from Sudan. I went to South Sudan and went to the went to the border of uh, uh, to the border of, of of Sudan, and I met this. Uh, uh, grandmother who fled from Khartoum, she arrived in South Sudan. And she was uh, uh, telling me that she's an elderly woman with her husband. Uh, she told her daughter it will be easier for her to cross, to cross the border with the little girl, with her granddaughter. And she said, my daughter didn't want me to take the, to take the girl, but I insisted. And she said, I was able to, I was able to, uh, uh, to cross. I was not raped on the way as, as most women uh, experience. But she said, the little girl got raped inside the camp in South Sudan, in Avail. And, uh, and, and she said, I owe it to my daughter to seek justice for that girl. And uh, I reported the case, the Sudanese refugee who raped her uh, was detained, was arrested and, and is being detained. She says, I want to pursue justice, but uh, I don't have the means anymore because I have to go back and forth to the police station. I have to pay for that medical certificate. I have to pay for that document. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, uh, to, to abandon it. And that's also something that we really have to uh, to reflect on, uh, even in the context of, uh, even in the context of Ukraine, but in general, I mean, like, why do we silo justice on the one hand and and uh, and and and, and, and services? Uh, how do we? Uh, the, I, I mentioned this case because it's important to understand the holistic, the, the holistic services that. The survivors need from the most immediate one, of course, being medical services, psychological services, and I'm happy that the Minister of Health is going to speak uh, because uh, at best what, what survivors of sexual violence are receiving is uh, uh, psychosocial support, which is not always adapted to the trauma that they, that they experience, but also legal support, also access to, to, to justice, also uh, livelihood support, because most of these uh, survivors uh, are struck by the double tragedy of, uh, uh, of rape and, uh, uh, and, and, and rejection. So in the, in the 15 years, because the mandate, as I mentioned, was created in 2009 through the adoption of Security Council Resolution 1888. So next year, will, next September will be, will be 15 years. Uh, in 15 years, we've seen, we've seen progress uh, at the normative level in terms of, uh, at the level of the council, we've had more and more Security Council resolution, for example, recognizing after what ISIS did in 2016 to the Yazidi women to recognize uh, uh, 
uh, sexual, uh, the nexus between sexual violence and, 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 and trafficking. Uh, Security Council resolution has equipped us with more tools, for example, sanctions through the designation of uh, uh, sexual violence as standalone criteria uh, for, for sanctions. But what, what is uh, problematic is how do we translate all these resolution into, into solutions, uh, into solutions on, on, on the ground. And, and that, is, that was my opening statement before the Council last July to ask members of the Council, uh, what does your resolution, uh, six resolutions dedicated on country-created sexual violence means right now to a victim in, in Ukraine or in Ethiopia or in Myanmar or, or uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Sudan. So, that, that, that's why when I when I took office, I set up I set only two strategic priorities for the mandate, and and I think the government of Lithuania that has really that is really focused on the prevention and response to conflict related sexual violence uh, should 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 bear this in mind, but also other governments. Uh, for me, uh, the we have to address the root causes. Uh, we, we are dealing with a crime that is preventable because for too long, sexual violence was perceived as being collateral damage and inevitable byproduct of war. Uh, and, 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 and that's why it was, uh, it was the least, it, it turned out to be the least condemned and the most silenced crime. So for me, the first priority is prevention. Uh, through justice and accountability uh, as a deterrent, because uh, if we do not, uh, as the minister mentioned, if we if we let those per those those perpetrators off, uh, I mean, like we're making of this uh, weapon a very cheap and effective weapon, uh, cheap because impunity prevails. Uh, it's it's cost free to rape a woman, a child, a man, or a boy, uh, and it's effective because it's intended to to uh, to damage, uh, to violate not only the victim but the family, the community, and it is a very effective tool. So for me, it's about prevention for justice and accountability, but also prevention through addressing the root cause with gender inequality, discrimination, marginalization and poverty as, as, uh, as the root cause. And secondly, uh, I said when I took office, the first thing that I said was, for me, this mandate has the face of a survivor. It was created for the survivors. And there was a recognition by the Security Council in 2009 that sexual violence was being used as a tactic of war, was a threat to international peace and security, and that women and girls were significantly impacted. So it has the face of a survivor, a man, a woman and a girl significantly, but also men and boys, and that we need to have a survivor, we need a survivor-centered approach, an approach that actually understands the, uh, the experience of the survivors and, and, and their needs. And that's why, uh, for me, the terminology is, is important, that we, we understand, we call it what it is. It's conflict-related sexual violence. Uh, because within the UN system, when you talk about gender-based violence or, or, or sexual and gender-based violence, you, we're not talking about the same thing. This one is very, very specific. It is sexual violence used as a strategy, as a military strategy. Uh, but when you're talking about SGBV or GBV in general, uh, you could be talking about domestic, you could be talking about domestic uh, violence, you could be talking about FGM, or, uh, and, and the experience is completely different. The needs are, I mean, like the psychosocial support that is adapted to uh, to a victim of domestic violence is completely irrelevant for i mean like they need a, they need a lot more they need specialized uh, mental health services and that is why the rate of ptsd is uh, uh, is so high they need 
timely and uh, t timely medical services, especially sexual and reproductive uh, reproductive rights. They need socioeconomic integration. They need livelihood support because they are uh, often struck by rape and rejection. I mean, like I was, I just came from DRC and I, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. I was in the eastern part of the country. I was in a camp in in Goma, and I met women who had been raped like a week ago, two weeks ago. And I asked them whether they had reported. They said, no, they came for, I met them in a hospital where they were receiving treatment. They said, no, they have not reported to the, to the authorities, but their husband saw them with the medication and they said they were raped and they have already been, been rejected. The husband has walked away, leaving them with five kids, 10 kids. So, and these women were, it, it was a very uh, uh, difficult, uh, thing that I experienced because this is the first time I think I've been in camps in DRC uh, four times but this is the first time that I saw a proliferation of brothels uh, where women are, are selling their bodies for 200 francs less than a dollar to feed their families because as they go out to fetch firewood to look for water for food they get raped uh, so they they uh, there is a proliferation of brothels inside the camp and around the camps in thousands. And, uh, and, and the women came up to me and said, we are married women, but we are going there because the choice is about seeing our children uh, die of hunger uh, uh, or uh, uh, just getting raped and and so it's 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 really about economic survival so it's it's survival sex on a grand on a grand scale uh, and and I, I had never seen uh, anything anything like that and that's why the focus that i'm bringing uh, for the mandate uh, over the past six years is really that survivor-centered approach and i was able to get in 2019 a security council resolution that recognized uh, that survivor-centered approach in prevention and response is, is, is critical. I have been, uh, I'm putting a lot of emphasis on the need for the holistic services that, that includes uh, livelihood support, that include psychological uh, specialized mental health services uh, that uh, I have brought uh, after two years of advocacy, brought attention on, on what used to be a huge policy gap, children born of sexual violence, children born of rape, who are often stateless, invisible victims. And, and these are some of the areas where I'm bringing a lot of, um, of attention. Uh, I just want to end to say that, that uh, survivors need more than our solidarity. Uh, they need, they need tangible support in the form of these services, justice, reparations. Uh, and, and, and today, uh, what we are confronted with at the UN is that all our humanitarian um, plans are being funded at less than a quarter. So resources are scarce after COVID. We, we felt it after COVID, but even more after the war in Ukraine for the other countries, but even for Ukraine. I mean, like I have, pro, I have projects that I have started in Ukraine, but I don't know when I will get the money for the second year. And these are very, very comprehensive uh, projects. I mean, like really model projects that we have launched in, in, in Ukraine that I'll be able to, to speak about uh, late, later on. Uh, for which we are still waiting for uh, to, to get the funds. Uh, we uh, both the service very holistic, really holistic. The the whole chain uh, of of uh, uh, support that that a survivor requ requires, but for the other countries as well. And and recently, I have start started to engage with civil society, with private sector, to try and get even small small donation uh, that I can uh, divert to the other countries. 
uh, for for smaller projects that that can bring some solace to the uh, to the victims. So I just wanted to end on 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 that note that uh, I think we owe it to the uh, to the survivors to keep the spotlight on 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 this and that we we we, we never uh, forget that wars have a human face uh, and that uh, sexual we should not allow sexual violence to be uh, to continue to be the invisible. Uh, invisible crime and 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 the extremely cost-free and, and effective crime that that it has been. Thank you. Ačiū pramilai ir dabar kviečiu Kristina Fabre Europos Lyčių Lygybės instituto atstovę. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, and uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. Uh, thank you to, for the, the, to the uh, Lithuanian government for inviting Eigen, and uh, it's an honor to, to share the, 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 the table with you. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, for the ones that uh, who don't know that uh, what the European Institute for Gender Equality is, I just want to mention that it's the European Union agency that uh, supports EU institutions and member states in uh, promoting and advancing the gender equality, meaning that uh, equality between women and men in all their diversity. So having said so, I just uh, want to mention that in terms of, of uh, peace, approximately 35% of the women are experiencing gender-based violence. And according to the, time, to, to the data from the UN Nations Office uh, for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, this number increases to 70%. So 70% of women worldwide are experiencing uh, violence against women or gender-based violence uh, worldwide. These, these violations can occur uh, for the women fleeing the, the conflict, but it also occurs when, uh, during the transit, when the women are during their journey to the destination countries and in the destination countries. Over 8 million of uh, pe persons have fled Ukraine, most of them women and children. And uh, we have heard and already documented, we have read the documentations of multiple place, uh, cases of rape used as a weapon of war in the Ukraine by Russian forces. But women and children are exposed to sexual violence at every stage of the journey. Apart from the consequences of violence that we have already documented uh, and uh, explored and, 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 uh, and, uh, and researched, that the consequences of, uh, of uh, violence on mental and uh, physical health, we see that women and girls, due to the conflict-related sexual violence, they are facing forced pregnancy, sexual transmitted infections, different types of genital trauma. Studies conducted uh, uh, during the war in the Balkans showed that more than 70% of the participants, women participants in the studies, uh, had uh, post-traumatic syndromes or symptoms and among others suffered from long life gynecological problems. I'm not going into the details of the gynecological problems that they were suffering, but then it's clear that women and girls affected by conflict-related sexual violence require specialized sexual and reproductive health care services. That's why the European Institute for Gender Equality undertook a study to assess the, how women and girls fleeing the war in Ukraine could access their sexual and reproductive rights and could access the, the, the healthcare services in the European Union. The European Parliament has called the, the European Union to step up the fight against the use of rape as a weapon of war and to guarantee ex access to sexual and reproductive health services for rape victims. The European Parliament also called in 2022 the Member States to decriminalize abortion and remove and combat obstacles to safe and legal abortion and ensure access to sexual and reproductive health care uh, services. 
Eige has therefore developed a study to assess how women fleeing the war under the Temporary Protection Directive can exercise their sexual and reproductive rights and access the services in the European Union. We conducted a survey, an online survey, in all European Union member states, and we also conducted the different uh, semi-structure interviews to better assess the challenges that women and girls face in accessing these, uh, these uh, healthcare services in the European Union. We examined six uh, services that were the emergency contraception, uh, sexual transmitted uh, prevention and, uh, and treatment, a specialized obstetric and gynecological care, short and long-term psychological counseling, and safe abortion and post-abortion care. The Temporary Protection Directive says that member states must provide necessary medical assistance to persons who have special needs, such as persons who have been victims of sexual violence and torture. I'm just going to, to, to mention the, the, the key findings of this study. And, uh, and we have seen that the Temporary Protection Directive proved to be an, uh, an, a useful uh, tool to grant access to sexual and reproductive services, but the gaps in accessing them still remain. For example, in three member states, women and girls fleeing the war are not entitled to emergency contraception and, on, and one member state does not offer long-term psychological counseling. Further gaps concern the lack of legal entitlement to save abortion cares in two member states. More efforts, therefore, are needed to ensure that, uh, that sexual and reproductive uh, health cares are free of charge. Half of, the member, half of the member states declared that six services examined were provided for free but two member states require payment for all the six uh, services. In the remaining member states, only selected uh, number of services are for free, and emergency contraception and safe abortion are, are uh, not covered in one third of the EU member states. The, the availability of the services is also severely affected by a strict national legislation particularly restrictive abortion laws and ambiguities in relation to the provision of abortion, meaning that in some cases the report of the offence is mandatory and the need to obtain a prosecutor's certificate to terminate the, preg the pregnancy is also mandatory. There's also mandatory pe reflection period and, uh, and the uh, and, uh, staff, medical staff can use the consensus objection to perform an abortion. So that means that, uh, that the women and girls still face a lot of problems in accessing safe abortion, despite their legal status or the, 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 um, the, the causes of their pregnancy, forced pregnancy, meaning that uh, we are constantly revictimizing the, the victims. There is also a, a need for solutions to ensure that victims, minors, can access confidential, sorry, can access confidential, Can access, confidential, uh, can access confidential and comprehensive uh, services. Parental consent and age limits mark a significant uh, access barrier. Emergency contraception is not available without parental consent in six member states. And uh, parental consent is also mandatory for different services such as the long-term psychological counseling. During, the, during the, the survey that we were conducting, we, fe, we see that for, for we, we met uh, like uh, different people and for instance, one of the, of the victims that we met was in Germany, a 17 years old girl that uh, was torn away from the evidence collection uh, because she did not want to inform her parents about the sexual assault that she experienced. So as the UN Special Rapporteur, we have seen that uh, shame, fear, stigma are still a lot of uh, uh, causes for the minors, but also for the women in, in the reporting these cases. A specialized sexual assault and uh, centers and rape crisis centers were identified in only 13 member states. 
apart from these centers that, uh, that uh, try to ensure a more com comprehensive provision of services in a gender and, and cultural uh, sensitive manner, the holistic support could also be provided by adopting national guidelines, which we found in only 12 member states, or, or bettering the referral mechanisms between the different services that we found in only 17 member states. So gaps are, identif uh, are identified in non-availability in providing female or having female staff, medical staff available. There's also lack of interpreters, so meaning that the that, uh, language barrier also uh, hinders women from accessing these services. The research also show the crucial role of the NGOs and women's rights organizations that provide specialized support for victims. These organizations fill the gaps of the provision of services for victims. Their support is particularly prominent when it comes to short and long-term psychological counseling. Finally, if member states really want to help and support the victims, they first have to establish measures that will enable healthcare providers, the police, the social care sector, and the NGOs to assist victims in a holistic and coordinated way. To do so, governments need to introduce national guidelines and trainings for professionals on how to respond to sexual violence and also consider the specific challenges and context of this type of violence in armed conflict. We need to have like a tailored services to meet the needs of these victims. Government action has evolved in the last uh, decades to respond to domestic violence by strengthening their legal frameworks, by, by ratifying most of them the Istanbul Convention, but there are, that they have raised awareness. So in this sense, I'm positive that with this political will all forms of gender-based violence, including the conflict-related, can be tackled and all victims can be supported and assisted. Government, government support is the core need to overcome all these challenges in accessing specialized services. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. O dabar norėčiau pakviesti mūsų pirmąją diskusiją, svečius čia prie stalo ir pristatymus, tik tais, kadangi matau laikė, truputį atsiliekame, aš prašysiu mūsų ministerijos socialinės apsaugos ir ministerijos pristatymą į galą, Jolantą Nukelsiu, gerai. O tokiu atveju dabar pradėtumėm nuo Signerį Salo, Estijos socialinės apsaugos ministrės nuotolių pristatymo ir tema mūsų bus toliau diskusijos apie tai, Kaip dalinsimės gerąją patirtimį, kaip mes galime užtikrinti efektyvės apsaugos, pagalbos ir prevencinės priemonės seksualinio smurto koms. Ačiū, Kristina, tai jūs. Thank you for yeah, please sit here. And, uh, ir tuomet kviečiu čia prie stalo uh, Jolantą teikite jūs, Konstantį Radžvil, Radžvil uh, Lenkijos Respublikos ambasadorius Lietuvoje, Diana Jakaitė, uh, bus Latvijos gerovės ministerijos valstybės sekretorijos pavaduotoja, Aurimas Pečkauskas, sveikatos apsaugos viceministras, Lolita Plančiūnaitė, Vaičiulienė kriminalinės policijos biuro atstovė, Arūnas Meška generalinės prokuratūros vir prokuroro pavaduotojas, Dalia Puidokienė Klaipėdo socialinės apsaugos ir psichologinės paramos centro vadovė, Kristina Mišinienė kovos su prekyba žmonėmis ir išnaudojimų centro vadovė ir Reda Jūra Labičiūtė, viešosios įstaigos ribologija viena iš staigėjų, kuri prisijungs nuotolių. Šau. Tai prašysiu tuomet pradėti Signe Risalo, Estijos socialinės apsaugos ministrė. Please. Your ministers and uh, Mrs. Patton uh, and also colleagues uh, working on uh, such important uh, issue. Victims of sexual uh, um, violence suffer not once this is lifelong damage 
including uh, post-traumatic disorders. And um, children, also uh, people with disabilities, um, elderly people, and obviously refugees are more vulnerable than others. I am very happy that uh, Estonia also uh, gives um, our small but important uh, input uh, and also uh, supporting financially the work uh, United Nations is doing in the office uh, of Mrs. Uh, Patton. But I have to say that uh, currently in Estonia there are no specialized services for Ukrainian uh, refugees. Ukrainian refugees uh, are treated the same way as uh, other non-Estonian citizens according uh, to the law. But this is uh, also uh, the same treatment uh, what our uh, Estonian citizens will, uh, will get, including uh, health care and, uh, of course, uh, gynecologists. We uh, also uh, offer language courses uh, to uh, Ukrainian refugees just because uh, make them uh, uh, more um, part of our society. And uh, we are lucky to say that uh, 53 percentage of uh, grown-up refugees are actively on the labor market, which means that they are less vulnerable if they are part of our society. But we do have also youth uh, sexual health centers, which are without parental consent uh, to everyone uh, until uh, 26 years old. And this is, of course, uh, uh, without uh, any taxes. So it's available for, for all young people uh, in Estonia. In Estonia, there is a comprehensive uh, state-organized and founded victim support uh, system. And I have to say that uh, we recently hosted uh, mental health and uh, psychosocial support uh, um, uh, simultaneous uh, training uh, in Estonia. Uh, there were people uh, around the world from uh, 35 different countries, including uh, Ukrainian colleagues, who are currently running uh, training uh, uh, in Ukraine, but at the same time helping uh, victims. Among the uh, other things, special attention in the victim support system is given to the prevention of sexual violence and the protection of uh, uh, its victims. Important is uh, multi-sectoral cooperation. And in Estonia, the uh, task is uh, 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 organized so that uh, several ministers uh, are involved, including Ministry of uh, uh, Justice, uh, Minister of Internal Affairs, uh, Minister of Social Affairs, obviously, uh, in Estonia, the healthcare is also in the Ministry of Social Affairs, and, um, and uh, many other ministers uh, uh, with, um, with um, uh, smaller tasks. Um, Estonian government uh, has put uh, a lot of effort, uh, effort uh, to, uh, to prevent uh, uh, and uh, protect uh, uh, victims of, uh, of um, uh, sexual violence. First of all, training uh, for individuals uh, who come into contact with victims of sexual violence, such as um, by offering e-courses, in psychological first aid and trauma-informed practices to ensure all professionals are aware of the impact of violence of the uh, victim. This uh, uh, protects, uh, protects the victim's right uh, to um, uh, dignified, uh, respectful treatment and uh, follows the principles outlined in victims' assistance uh, legislation, which is renewed uh, uh, this uh, year. Data of uh, uh, participants in sexual violence crisis centers. We do have four such uh, crisis centers in, uh, in Estonia, and support groups are protected and anonymous. Uh, 
uh, adhering to uh, confidentiality rules. Services at these centers are provided based on clients' consent and request. The same principle applies to referral to victim uh, uh, support. Continuous collaboration with the police and border guard department ensure, for instance, the safety of individuals uh, during uh, nightlife and protecting uh, victims. For example, we have uh, such a bro the project uh, Night uh, Furies. Uh, despite warning about uh, the harmful effects of drugs, including alcohol, substance use, uh, especially during the um, entertainment event events, remains um, a norm. Uh, this can result in uh, negative consequences for the user, uh, the people around them and the environment. Uh, this initiative means that we have uh, workers in nightclubs who try to keep safe uh, our, um, our uh, uh, young people um, and uh, uh, young girls. Sexual violence victims um, uh, are offered crisis services, psychological, uh, individual assistance and support groups in various regions. Plans are uh, underway to expand these support groups in all regions uh, of Estonia. Crisis support is available to all, including Ukrainian refugees or other uh, refugees uh, or vulnerable groups irrespective of uh, their insurance uh, status. A dedicated service uh, for minors affected by sexual violence has been established, Children's House, which is evidence-based uh, way to help children who um, uh, has been uh, sexually um, violated. And an effective uh, notification system uh, operates between sexual violence services and the child protection agencies. Uh, on the field of pro prevention, organizing additional training courses on sexual violence uh, for relevant professionals and a broader, broader target group. Uh, by the end of the year, a basic training curriculum will be developed uh, for staff and professionals in related uh, fields. We see that it's uh, most important that people who are working uh, with victims are uh, highly informed uh, how to to uh, help people uh, in, uh, in such a difficult uh, situation. Promoting the importance of sexual education in uh, preventing sexual violence in collaboration with the Child Protection Agency. Um, we do have um, uh, special training for child protection workers and they do have uh, to retrain themselves uh, periodically. Uh, Continue, continuation of the flag system training and development of uh, air courses. The flag system helps professionals working with children up to 18 years old to uh, um, assess which um, sexual behaviors are acceptable and uh, which are not. This is what we are doing uh, from the kindergarten. And, um, and this uh, helps a lot to uh, recognize uh, the uh, behavior which is not acceptable and help these uh, children. Uh, from a, a preventive perspective, uh, there's um, an ongoing effort uh, to develop a notification to introduce the assistance uh, uh, options of the social insurance board to local municipalities uh, and other partners. It's crucial to consider all target groups and not uh, overlook uh, emergency situations. Our Minister of Foreign Affairs um, uh, uh, are supporting different uh, projects for those who are currently re residing in Ukraine. For example, uh, they are supporting NGO uh, Mondo's uh, work. Mondo financed uh, uh, 2,200 online psychological consultations uh, helping uh, people who are in need of help in Ukraine, which could be uh, requested by every Ukrainian who suffered from the war in uh, Ukraine. Uh, we do have uh, uh, also possibilities uh, to give support to Ukrainians who live here in Estonia, um, uh, mental health services in uh, Ukraine, uh, also via internet. This is what we are doing uh, for uh, uh, Ukrainian people 
but obviously we are not on the on the uh, battlefield uh, in Ukraine but we do our best to help Ukrainian Ukrainians who are here in Estonia and as I um, started uh, in the same way like we help uh, our own Estonian uh, people and I really hope that uh, all this crisis uh, um, in addition to Ukraine, we see what happens in uh, in uh, the conflict of uh, uh, Palestine and Israel, that there is um, not more uh, uh, young girl, women and also boys who suffer sexual um, uh, violence. But um, the truth is that there will be and uh, the work and especially international work and the work you are doing, uh, Mrs. Patton, in the United Nations is um, um, very much um, needed and important. And I do appreciate um, uh, uh, that. I also would like to say thank you to uh, uh, Lithuania, because uh, uh, this is um, absolutely uh, important to, uh, to um, um, talk about uh, uh, such difficult uh, issues and try to to uh, try to uh, give the international support uh, to Ukraine and Ukrainian uh, people uh, including the victims of uh, of um, uh, sexual uh, violence thank you Dėkuoju Estijos socialinės apsaugos ministrė ir dabar duodu žodį Konstantį Radzvil. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I would uh, speak on as a representative of the country. I would speak rather on the on behalf of the Ministry of uh, family and social um, uh, affairs, as well as the Ministry of Interior of uh, the Republic of Poland. Um, the scale of conflict-related sexual violence against civilians in many different parts of the world is of paramount concern. The use of all forms of sexual violence is as weapons or tactic of war is widespread. The most affected are women and girls and vulnerable groups. Conflict-related sexual violence has long been regarded as an unfortunate uh, yet inevitable byproduct of war and terror. Uh, Poland, the Polish historical experience of 20th uh, century is here also terrifying. This has resulted in the growing culture of impunity and the lack of accountability. We need to end this immediately. If the world manages to reduce impunity and brings perpetrators to justice, we will be able to send a clear and strong message to victims that their voices have been heard and to offenders or possible future offenders that the days of meaningless warnings are over. Poland underscores the importance of women's participation in all processes related to ending sexual violence in conflicts, including peace talks. Female negotiators can be guarantee survivors centered approach, including the rehabilitation of women survivors of conflict related sexual violence ensuring post-conflict reparations and accountability, as well as the establishment of vetting mechanisms excluding perpetrators of sexual violence from the security forces. Poland supports peacekeeping and monitoring missions so that they are capable of providing adequate protection to victims of all forms of violence. In this vein, Poland endorses further deployment of women's protection advisors and broader use of early warning indicators of conflict-related sexual violence. 
Poland, Poland as a neighbor of Ukraine and a country hosting the biggest community of Ukrainian refugees is appalled by the growing accounts of sexual violence and deliberately by Russian soldiers as a tactic of war and a tool of terror and intimidation. To show you the size of the problem from our side, uh, I, I'd like to inform you that uh, since the beginning of the war, more than 16 million millions of uh, the of the Ukrainians crossed the border. Among them, 3.7 millions declared themselves as refugees. And even now, just uh, the report from from yesterday, this is four to five thousand refugees crossing the border every day still also massive displacement caused by the russian aggression has hated the risks of all forms of sexual violence and has disproportionately affected women and girls including the risk of trafficking among the refugees already in different countries. In the face of this unprecedented crisis, Polish government has urgently implemented new immigration measures for Ukrainian citizens fleeing their country. The new law was adopted on the 12th of March uh, 2022, with the effect from the uh, 24th of February 2022. In line with these regulations, Ukrainian citizens have access to uh, Polish, to entire Polish healthcare system, including mental health uh, system, uh, on the same grounds as Polish citizens, and also to other psychosocial uh, support needed, uh, most often in Ukrainian language. Accountability is a key factor to ensure that perpetrators of such actions improve their compliance with international obligations. Failure to act decisively now will only encourage the abusers to follow these barbaric tactics. International community must ensure that all perpetrators, including the leadership, will be brought to justice. Poland was one of the first states that has referred to the situation in Ukraine to the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. We will assist um, its efforts to collect evidence of Russia's war crimes committed in Ukraine. It happens already. Also, in order to collect and preserve evidence of crimes committed in Ukraine together with Lithuania and Ukraine, and in cooperation with the International Criminal Tribunal in The Hague, we have established a joint investigation team. The Pilecki Institute, Poland-based institution for research into crimes committed by totalitarian regimes, has established the Rafael Lemkin Center for Documenting Russian Crimes in Ukraine. Its task is to collect and preserve evidence of war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in Ukraine, as well as to collect and record witness, uh, witness testimonies. Thank you. Dėkuju Lenkijos Respublikos ambasadoriui Lietuvoje ir kviečiu Dianą Jakaitę, Latvijos Gerovės ministerijos valstybės, valstybės sekretorijos pavaduotojai. Diana, please. Thank you very much and distinguished participants. I'm very, very grateful that I can participate in this uh, seminar and share some views with you. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Latvia uh, is dedicated very much to give uh, support for Ukraine to build supporting uh, and assisting uh, services for people who have suffered sexual violence during this conflict uh, uh, conflict re related uh, sexual violence uh, and yet uh, Latvia hasn't done its homework actually because we do not have a 
specialized services for for survivals of uh, sexual violence. So we've heard what uh, Estonia uh, said to us about the establishing their services and Latvia cannot right now be proud of this because uh, we are still in our way. And uh, during our, my intervention, I will have two of them. Uh, but right now, I want to highlight four main issues which are crucial when we build the preventive measures and support system for victims of sexual violence. During my second intervention, I will focus more to our help to Ukraine. But right now, I want to highlight some issues which are common to, to Latvia. And uh, those main issues or priorities I, I want to uh, call upon uh, today, those are ability to recognize, to rec recognize sexual uh, violence, trust to agencies, specialized services and coordinated support or uh, a special representative from Mila Patton already said, a holistic approach. So I think those uh, four priorities, they are very common uh, uh, to sexual violence, or uh, we call sometimes it domestic violence, and it's common also for uh, that uh, sexual violence which happens in conflict-related uh, zones. And this is the, here I agree very much that, of course, it's uh, we should uh, uh, focus on uh, this conflict-related sexual violence and uh, should treat it at it's uh, a bit differently that it happens in domestic violence. But still, those priorities, they are common. The, uh, the difference is between which is more important in a situation. Uh, the EU-wide survey on violence against women conducted by European Agency of Fundamental Rights, uh, it revealed that uh, Latvia has an overall higher rate of women who experience violence uh, by their partners or ex-partners than in EU average. And 15% of women in Latvia has suffered sexual violence by partner or non-partner, which is by three percentage point higher than in overall in EU. It means that sexual violence in Latvia, it's unfortunately it present there. And uh, however, I have to mention that uh, to gain a full over your violence against women and domestic violence nationally cannot rely only on stati uh, official statistics alone because we see that it differs. Many victims do not seek uh, help uh, from the police or other agencies. And, it's, uh, and I'm talking about the situation when there is no conflict zone and still people do not have report. This is a really um, disturbing issue. Uh, and uh, the problem of uh, non-reporting is well illustrated by Latvian data, where violence disclosed in surveys exceeds multiple times data from the official statistics or administrative st data sources. So uh, the Ministry of Welfare ensures that victims of violence receive the social rehabilitation service. As I already said, it's not specialized. This is... Um, the, uh, it uh, doesn't matter whether the victim is uh, suffering from emotional violence or from uh, physical violence or sexual violence, uh, the service is the same. It's not specialized, unfortunately, right now, but we are moving forward to build the specialized services. And that statistics of service show that women most often had suffered from emotional violence and rarely, very rarely from sexual violence. So it definitely means that women suffer from sexual violence. Those women do not seek uh, help. And there are, of course, several reasons why. One of the reasons is recognition of sexual violence. In a conflict zone, there is no definition of recognition because everybody understands what it means. It's, it's very brutal violence, of course. But uh, in domestic violence, if we talk about domestic violence, then we see that uh, uh, sometimes women do not understand. It it's maybe sounds weirdly, but still women does sometimes do not understand that there is sexual, vi sexual violence. It can't, it's sometimes not physical, but it's still by talking, by insulting, by touching, and so on. And that's why it's important that women recognize that uh, they are suffering from sexual violence uh, in, uh, in their intimate life. 
And uh, what, what else? Women are not always sure if they will be helped because they feel guilt. And I think today we hear it's, it's very much uh, about this guilt and shame. And uh, women, they blame them, themselves. Uh, also, this is completely wrong assumption, of course. And we see that people with intellectual disabilities are often exposed to risks of, risks of sexual violence due to lack of knowledge, due to lack of understanding. And therefore, it's very important to ed educate those people and people who are around those people. I remember that when we organized displacement of uh, Ukrainian refugees, which were with intellectual disabilities, we worked very closely with our Ukrainian partner, uh, partners, NGOs, to ensure that those people come to Latvia very safely because they could be exposed to human trafficking during their uh, coming to Latvia because they had to cross several countries. So it's very important to uh, take care of those people who has difficulties to understand things that, which are happening to them. So and specialists working in different fields should have a common understanding of the problem of sexual violence. Uh, the very, uh, we, uh, we often see this victim blaming and it occurs when agencies base on their approach or assumptions or myths about violence against women and domestic violence and uh, they place this responsibility of violence upon women rather than the perpetrator. And we see this uh, in Latvia as well. And when we talk about this conflict zone, I, I think you today, uh, special representative, you highlighted very good this victim blaming thing and uh, how it becomes from our also uh, cultural patterns as well, which is absolutely astonishing, actually. In 2020, the Council of Europe published the report that offers a roadmap for establishing a specialized support uh, services for vic victims of violence against women and domestic violence in Latvia. This report was specially uh, built for Latvia uh, and we are very proud this, with this report because it gives us uh, uh, more like a, a, a louder voice uh, to go uh, and to talk with our partners that we have to build such uh, services. And of course, uh, this uh, report was in line with the Council of Europe Convention. We call it the Istanbul Convention, and Latvia has not ratified the Istanbul Convention, but still, uh, when we build upon uh, our services to support people, uh, the convention is uh, like a, a guideline for us. And of course, this report concluded there that there is lack of any specialized provision for victims of sexual violence and abuse in Latvia. And at this point, there are no uh, rape crisis centers or sexual violence referral centers in Latvia. Uh, and uh, this is the thing we have to uh, work upon in the newer future. And uh, it is urgently essential that there are specialist services for victims of sexual violence. And we see that uh, refugees from Ukraine are coming to Latvia as well. And they have, uh, of course, there are people who have suffered from sexual violence. And unfortunately, we cannot provide specialized services. But our NGOs, which uh, usually are those who uh, give support to uh, people, they are working on those specialized uh, services very much. And by that, they are bringing their experience to Perina as well. But I will touch upon that in a later time. So, and uh, uh, the well-coordinated actions, a holistic approach of all uh, actors to eliminate the violence against women, including sexual violence, is high on our agenda right now. As Latvia is working, unfortunately, on our first, not, not the second and third, but only the first plan on preventing combating violence against women and domestic violence. Um, so, yes, thank you. Dėkuoju labai Latvijos gerovės, ministerijos valstybės sekretoriaus pavaduotojai. Ir dabar truputį praleisim Aurimą Pečkauskas, Veikatos apsaugos ministrą, o paprašysiu Lolitą Plančiūnai Tėvaičiulienę, kad jį pristatytų, o Sveikatos apsaugos ministro pristatymas trumpas bus galia, jeigu turėsim dar laiko.
Sveiki visi. Labą dieną, gerbiamoji įgaliotinė. Ačiū renginio organizatoriams už pakvietimą, ačiū svečiams, ačiū kitiems dalyviams. Labai trumpai, dėja, bet policija yra dažniausiai reaguojantį jau į seksualinio smurto pasiekmes instituciją, tuo tarpu, kai šio nusikaltimo prevencija, visuomenės amoningumo didinimas, bei netolerancijos seksualiniam smurtu įskaitinimas yra bendras visų institucijų organizacijų uždavinys ir tikslas. Prieš šias kelias akimirkas, jų yra labai nedaug, aš trumpai pristatysiu mūsų statistiką šiek tiek teisės aktus ir pakalbėsiu apie ukrainiečius esančius mūsų šalyje ir seksualinį smurto jų atžvilgių. Tai labai trumpai matome, kad, kaip jie būtų gaila, matome, kad yra akivaizdus padidėjimas seksualinio pobūdžio nusikaltimų. Per 9 metų mėnesius yra registruota 40 procentų daugiau įžaginimų, bei 28 procentais daugiau tvirkinimo atveju, ne per visus 2022 metus. Nepaisant to, verta pažymėti, kad daugiau negu pusę šių nusikalstamų veikų vis tik būna dažniausiai nutraukiama nenustačios nusikaltimų požymių. Vis tik, nors šis skaičiai augimas atrodytų ir verčia sunerimti, tačiau manytina, kad viena iš labiausiai tikėtinų šių skaičių augimo priežasčių yra vis tik didėjantis visuomenės amoningumas ir netolerancijos seksualiniam smurtu įskatinimas viešoje erdvėje. Ilgą laiką šiuos nusikaltimus buvo galima priskirti prie latentinių nusikaltimų, apie seksualinį smurtą buvo baugu kalbėti, apie jį pranešti bei kreiptis pagalbos. Aukos likdavo vienas su savo patirtimi, eidamas per sudėtingą baudžiamo proceso kelią, kuris dažnai reikšdavo tik tai vieną – neišvengiamą antrinę viktimizaciją, tai yra pakartodinį traumavimą. Kas gilėme šiuos atrodytų bauginančiai augančius skaičius, tačiau pažvelgus vis tik įdėmiau, visai neblogas tendencijas identifikuojančius pranešimų apie seksualinio smurto atveju skaičius. Tai visų pirma, bendras institucijų darbas inicijuojant teisės aktų pokyčius ir sustelkimas juos įgyvendinant. Neginčiama pokyti lėmė apsaugos nuo smurto artimoje aplinkoje, pagalbos nuo nusikalstamos veikos nukentėjusiams asmenims įstatymai, baudžiamo proceso kodeksų nuostatų tobulimas ir jų įgyvendinimo užtikrančių teisės aktų priėmimas. Taip pat tikrai patobulėjęs vaiko teisių apsaugos pagrindų įstatymas, kuriame taip pat yra apibrėžti ir seksualinio smurto samprata, bei didelę reikšmę turintis ir tarp institucinėje teisės aktai, kuris be ne pagrindinis iš šių metų yra šių metų liepa atnaujantas penkio šalį susitarimas tarp prokuratūros, policijos departamento, vaiko teisių ir įvaikinimo tarnybos, vaiko teisių kontrolieriaus, socialinės apsaugos darbo ministerijos ir vidaus reiklų ministerijos, įpareigojantis vis tik, kad ne vėliau ne per penkias dienas policijos pareigūnas privalo inicijuoti tarp žinybinę koordinavimo grupę, kurios tikslas yra sudėrinti kelių skirtingų institucijų veiksmų, siekiant apsaugoti nukentėjus nepilną metį nuo neigiamo baudžiamo proceso poveikio ir tinkamai užtikrinti jo intereso apsaugą bei teisų įgyvendinimą. Taip pat didelė, nepaprastai didelė reikšmė seksualinio smurto užkardimui bei tyrimui turėjo ir specializuotos pagalbos centrų, teikiančių nukentėjusioms nuo smurto aukom specializuotą kompleksinę pagalbą, steigimas. Vaiko seksualinio smurto atvejais nepamainomu ne tik seksualinį smurtą patyrusiems vaikams, bet ir šių nusikaltimų tyrimą atliekantiems policijos pareigūnams tapo vaikų nukentėjus nuo seksualinės prievartos pagalbos centras. Bet to tikrai nepaprastai didelę viltį mes kaip policijos pareigūnai dedame į ką tik įkurtą nacionalinį informacijos apie seksualinį smurtą centrą, finansuojamą socialinės apsaugos ir darbo ministerijos, net nebijoju, kad socialinės apsaugos ir darbo ministerijos atstovai daugiau papasakos apie šį centrą. Kas dar buvo padaryta, tai iš tiesų buvo labai nemažai investuotai ir sutaltos pajėgos į policijos pareigūnų mokymus. Pareigūnai mokome atpažinti, reaguoti bei užtikrinti pirminę būtiną pagalbą seksualinio smurto aukoms. Ši tema yra apdariama ne tik smurto artimoje aplinkoje ar smurto dėl lyties kontekste, tačiau ir prekybos žmonėmis plotmėje. Per įvairias tobulimo programas bei kvalifikacijos kelimo renginius per pastarį dešimtmetį buvo apmokyta daugiau nei pustrečio tūkstančio metų policijos pareigūnų. Ir trumpai apie Ukrainos karo kontekstą ir čia esančius 
ukrainiečius, tai šiai dienai Lietuvoje registruota virš 81 tūkstančio karo pabėgėlių, iš kurių yra 26 tūkstančiai vaikų. Be abejo, mes kaip policija žiūrime ir per savo prizmę, kad nemažai Ukrainos piliečių tapo ir įtariamaisiais, ir nukentėjusiais, tačiau pažymėtina, kad dauguma iki teisinių tyrimų buvo atliekama ir pradėta dėl tokių nusiklastumų vaikų, kaip smurtas artimoje aplinkoje, vagystės, sukčiavimai, nelegalios migracijos organizavimo ir kitų nusikaltimų. Taip pat vykdyta nuolatinė stebėsina, tai yra nuo karo pradžios policijoje buvo vykdoma kasdienę registruotų įvykių susijusių su situacijoje Ukrainą stebėsina ir grėsmių vertinimas. Policija reaguodama į galimas Rusijos karo prieš Ukrainą grėsmės organizavo prevencinės priemonės atvykstantie Ukrainams piliečiams, paskyrė registracijos centrų koordinatorius, įdarbino 14 ukrainiečių registracijos centruose, Pirminiai iš Ukrainos atvykstančių piliečių registracijai. Šiuo metu policija dirba septyni Ukrainos piliečiai, kurie padeda bendradarbiauti, susikalbėti su Ukrainos karo pabėgėliais. Taip pat buvo sudaryta darbo grupė ir patvirtintas priemonių planas, vykdyta kas savaitinė rizikos analizė dėl prekybos žmonėmis. Policija vykdė ir prevencinius pabėgėlių iš Ukrainos turinčių didžiausią riziką nukentėti nuo prekybo žmonėmis vizitus. Tai reiškia, kad mes sudarėme klausimimą, mes nusistatėme galimus kriterijus, pagal kuriuos asmenys galėtų tapti prekybo žmonėmis saukomis. Ir pagal šiuos nustatytus kriterijus, atrinktus asmenys, policija prevenciškai lankė, stengdamasi ne tik tai įspėti apie prekybo žmonėmis grėsmes, bet taip pat išaiškinti, kokios jų būtų teisės ir galimybės, Mes gauti pagalbą, jeigu jos yra nukentėjusios ne tik nuo prekybos žmonės, bet ir nuo seksualinio pobūdžio nusikaltimo. Taigi, atsižvelgiant į vykdytas prevencinės priemonės, turime rezultatą. Nepaisant prognozuotų grėsmių dėl galimo prekybos žmonėmis atveju nuo karo bėgančių Ukrainos piliečių atžilgių šuolio, situacija išliko stabili. Nuo karo prieš Ukrainą pradžios mes Lietuvoje turime pradėtus tris iki teisinius tyrimus dėl galimos prekybos žmonėmis. Dėja tik tai vienas iš jų baigtas sėkmingai, tai reiškia kaltinamojo aktu. Ukrainėta mergina buvo atgabenta čia taip pat Ukrainos piliečių teikti seksualinės paslaugas. Vienas iki teismės buvo nutrauktas ir taip pat turime dar vieną iki teismį tyrimą eigoje. Savo ruoštų dėl seksualinio smurto Ukrainos piliečių atžvilgių Lietuvoje buvo pradėti taip pat vos devineriai iki teisminiai tyrimai, tačiau daugiau negu pusėjų, daugiau negu 70 procentų iš jų informacijų nepasitvirtino ir jie buvo nutraukti nenustačius nusikalstamos veikos požymių. Ir kaip ir minėjo kolega iš Lenkijos, kad Lietuvoje yra atliekamas ir pradėtas iki teisminis tyrimas dėl karo nusikaltimų Ukrainoje, sudaryta jungtinė tyrimo grupė. Ir šiame tyrime taip pat be abejo yra renkami duomenis ir dėl galbūt padarytų seksualinio pobūdžių nusikaltimų, tačiau kadangi tai yra jautrus tyrimas, tai duomenu atskleisti negaliu, gal nebent prokuratūros, prokuroras gerbiamas galės daugiau papasakoti, bet... Gaunama, galiu pasibindrinti tai pasakyti, kad gaunama informacija yra tik kraid pavienė. Taigi, atsižvelgiant į esamą situaciją ir turimus duomenis, manytina, kad mes laikomės gal ir visai neblogai. Ar galima padaryti kažką daugiau ir geriau? Visada galima. Ta linkme ir dirbame. Ačiū Jums labai. Ačiū, Lalita. Dėkuoju, kad labai konkrečiai ir greitai. Dabar kviečiu gerbiamą Aruną Mešką, generalinės prokuratūros vir prokuroro pavaduotojų ir gerbiamą dėstojų. Labadiena visiem. Na, kai prokuroras esu išmokytas, kad Lietuvoje reikia visi procesai vyksta lietuvių kalba, jeigu kitiem nemokantiem užtikrinamas vertimas. Taigi, kalbėsiu lietuviškai ir pasistengsiu nekalbėti greitai, kad vertėjas pėtų versti. Iš tiesų, gavęs kvietimą į šį renginį jaučiausiai viliprasmiškai, nes turbūt mano padėtis yra pati nedėkingiausia, nes Mes kaip prokurorai negalim užimti kažkokios tai pozicijos ir jeigu įsivaizduotume tai temidės svarstiklės, tai ant vienos lėkštės šiose bylose mes dedame empatiją, tai yra nora padėti aukai, 
o į kitą mes dedam privalomą principą nešališkumas. Jeigu į kažkurią lėkštę mes įdėsim per daug, procesas bus neteisėtas ir neteisingas. Šiuo atveju, jeigu mes bandysime suteikti aukai kuo daugiau lengvatų, rodysim jai per teklinį dėmesį, stengsime, kad jai būtų sąlygos kuo geresnės, mes būsim apkaltinti pataikavimą aukai, o gynyba pasakys, kad mes nusipirkom aukos palankius parodymus savo tokiais veiksmais. Taigi, vėlgi persistent mes negalim. Tuo tarpu, jeigu mes Nešališkumo principą su absoliutinsimis virs abejingumo principu. Taigi, vėl šiuo atveju mes to daryti negalim. Ir matyt, kad šioje situacijoje mums labai gelbsti kitos organizacijos ir institucijos. Tai čia matyt, kad reiktų ačiū pasakyti nevyriausybininkam, kurie užsikrauna tą didelį krūvį dirbt su nusikaltimu aukom. Galbūt, kada nors Lietuvoje bus kaip kitose šalise, kurios, tarkim, prokuratūrose turi žmogų, kuris nėra procesinė figura, jis nėra prokuroras, bet jis atsakingas už bendravimą su nusikaltimu aukom. Jisai rūpinasi pagalbą jiems, kad gautų informaciją apie tą pagalbą, prieitų prie tos pagalbos, na, ir kad ta pagalba būtų realia. Dėje, na, mes kol kas atsižvelgiantį nūdienos realiją, jos tokių sąlygų neturim ir tokių darbuotojų pas save, na, irgi kol kas turėti neišgalim. Tačiau nereiškia, kad prokurorai nusišalina nuo pagalbos aukom. Mes iš tikrųjų dirbam aktyviai teisėkuros rytyje, tiprai tą savaitę teko Seime dalyvauti svarstant naujos direktyvos pagalbos aukom, kurį keičia 12 metų direktyvą ir ją papildo svarstime, kas mums Lietuvai tiktų, kas problematiška. Taigi, vėlgi dalyvaujam. Labai džiugu, kad prokuratūra palaikėm ir kartu su nevriausybinim organizacijom pakeitėm kodeksą, pasiūlėm pakeisti kodeksą dėl lydinčių asmenų, kur, na, vis tik tas lydintis asmo valstybėje nieko nekainavo biudžetį, o dažniausiai tai lydi nevyriausybininkai, kurie ir nuramina tą auką, ir suteikia jai kažkokią konsultaciją, kaip elgtis, ką daryt, kas čia su jie bus daroma, nes nudėja ne visada pareigūna įspėja tą apaiškinti, nors stengiamės ir mokom, kad tai būtų. Kitus projektus jau prieš tai buvusi kolegija iš Vardijo, taigi nenorėčiau užtemti labai, nes pasirašiau daug, bet laiko mažai, tai nenorėčiau atimti išgirbiamos dalios ir Kristinos laiko, nes jos tikrai turi pasakyti daug ką. Ačiū, uždėmėsi. Ačiū Rūnui labai ir iš karto tada ir perdodam daktriai dalį į Puiduokienį, Klaipėdo socialinės ir psichologinės paramos centro vadovį. Žodį, ačiū. Čia kažkaip turėčiau. Nežinau, ar čia gerai rodo, bet čia kažkodėl nerodo. Labą dieną visiems ir iš tikrųjų... O, dabar jau atsirado, matau. Ačiū labai. Labą dieną visiems ir... Iš tikrųjų labai džiaugiuosi, kad turiu garbės kalbėti apie tokią rimtą problemą ir tikrai norėdama pradėti, pirmiausiai noriu pasidžiaugti gerbiamos pramilos patent vizitų į mūsų šalį, atkreipiant, padedant atkreipti mums visiems dėmesį į tikrai labai svarbią problemą ir visiškai su jumis sutinku, kad labai svarbu kalbant apie šitą problemą, turėti į traumą orientuotą, į klientą orientuotą ir holistinį požiūrį. Tai labai džiaugiuosi tiesiog, dar kartą pakartoju jūsų išryškintus raktinius žodžius, 
kurie tikrai labai svarbus, kalbant apie šitą problemą, bet kurioje šalyje, bet kokiam kontekste, ne vien tik tai Lietuvoje. Noriu pasakyti ir noriu ko gero pasidžiaugti, nežiūrint tai, kad mes kalbam apie tikrai labai sunkią problemą, bet turiu pasidžiaugti, kad nežiūrint tai, kad tikrai turim pasakyti, ką dar turim padaryti Lietuvoje, Bet galim pasidžiaugti, jau daugiau nei dešimt turim apsaugos nuo smurto artimoje aplinkoje įstatymą, kuris išties mus galbūt išskiria nuo aplinkinių kaimynų, kuris išties atkreipia dėmesį ne vien tik tai pradėjus kalbėti apie šitą įstatymą į fizinį smurtą, bet tame tarpe ir seksualinį smurtą mes jau apie tai kalbam. Reikia pasidžiaugti, kad porą metų atgal mes jau turim, nežiūrint tai, galbūt turint, turint ir priekaištų nemažai, bet pagalbos nusikaltimo aukoms įstatymą, kuris vėlgi padeda mums žengti pagalbo žingsnius. Be abejonės baudžiamajam kodekse, kalbant apie seksualinę prievartą, mes turim keletą straipsnių, kurie, ko gero, kai prokuroras sakė, na, galbūt galima ir taisyti, ir reikia taisyti, bet vis tiek mes juos turime. Taigi, atrodytų, kad kažką turime, bet ir problemą turime. Ir problemą iš tikrųjų ir žmonių, kaip pareigūnė sakė, turime skaičius didesnius, o tai rodo, nepasakyčiau, ko gero čia būtų per drąsų sakyti, kad tai rodo, kad problema didėja ar daugiau nusikaltimų. Greičiausiai rodo, kad žmonės tampa atviresni, daugiau kalba apie tai ir tai yra geras ženklas. Tačiau, nežiūrint taip, problema iš ties pas mus vis tiek išlieka pakankamai rimta šalyje ir karo situacija, karo Rusijos su Ukraina situacija, ko gero, tik dar labiau tą problemą išryškino. Jeigu pasižiūrėti į tyrimus, aš čia paėmiau tik kelis skaičius. V 2021 metais buvo registruoti Lietuvoje 200 beveik apie 300 nusikaltimų ir baudžiamųjų nusižengimų seksualinio apsisprendimo laisvė ir neliečiamumui. Svarbu pastebėti ir tai, kad artimoje aplinkoje tarp sutuoktinių seksualinė prievarta tai yra vienas iš labiausiai tokių neatpažįstamų, nepripažįstamų smurto formų dažnai moterys, Vis dar galvoja, ir ne tik moteris, ir vyrai, vis dar galvoja, kad, na, jeigu žmona ar ten sugyventi nesutuoktinė, tai jos pareiga turėti seksualinius santykius su vyru. Dėja, vis dar dėja. 21 metais padarytas vykdytą apklausą lygčių stereotipai mokyklose taip pat atskleidė, kad beveik apie 20 procentų merginų ir 30 procentų vaikinų kalba, kad kartais merginos pačios išprovokuoja seksualinę prievartą. Tai va ta stereotipinė nuostata vis dar pas mus iš tikrųjų labai gaji ir kitaip tariant vienas iš dešimties vaikinų nesustotų iš merginos išgirdęs taip. Reiškia, na, tikrai turim... Ne, atsiprašau, ne, taip. 21 metais atlikto tyrimo taip pat rezultatai parodė, kad daugiau negu 30 procentų gyventojų žino arba pažįsta asmenų, kurie moterų, kurios yra nukentėjusios nuo seksualinės prievartos. 8 procentai žino ne vieną, o 24 procentai žino bent vieną tokią moterį. Aš kaip visada galvoju, kad bet kokie tyrimai jie visada parodo tendencijas, ko gero realybė dar kitokia. Tai dėl tos priežasties mums labai svarbu, kalbant apie seksualinę prievartą, kad iš tiesų Lietuvoje mes turėtumėm tokį centrą, kuris metodinį centrą ir labai džiaugiuosi, kad šitą iniciatyvą inicijavo ir remė socialinės apsaugos ir darbo ministerija ir planuojame tokio centro veiklas, tai metodinis pagalbos ir nacionalinis, taip mes jį pavadinom, nacionalinis informacijos apie seksualinį smurtą centras, na, trumpinys, galbūt aš čia pabandyčiau parodyti, trumpinys būtų nis, nis, taip, 
Taigi šitas, šito centro visą veiklą projekto, šito projekto pareiškėjas yra Klaipėdos socialinės ir psichologinės pagalbos centras ir kartu su trimis partneriais, moterų informacijos centru, moterų teisių asociacija ir ribologija, bandome įgyvendinti numatytą šito centro veiklas. Kodėl svarbu šitas centras? Todėl, kad iš tiesų, kaip, kaip jau šiandien ir kalbėjo kiti prieš mane kalbėjo pranešėjai, kad seksualinės prievartos problemos sprendimo iššūkių vis dar turime, kad reikalingas toks metodinis centras, nes jisai tarsi apjungtų visas veiklas, kad reikalingi pokyčiai, kalbant apie seksualinę prievartą visuomenėje, galų galę tų pačių specialistų tarpė, kad reikalingas bendradarbiavimas tarp įvairių sektorių, įvairių sričių specialistų, kas yra labai svarbu ir, ir kad išpildytų tą būtent holistinį požiūrį ir kad reikalinga pagalba ne tik nukentėjusiems asmenims, kas nebejotina, bet reikalinga pagalba ir patiems specialistams, kad jie galėtų teikti pagalbą kitiems. Kita vertus, kalbant apie šitą centrą, Labai svarbu pastebėti, kad mes bandome bent jau žengdami pirmosius žingsnius apimti tikslinės grupės, būtent specialistus, kurie teikia pagalbą arba kurie dirba prevencijos organizavime, taip pat asmenis, kurie nukentėjo ir taip pat plačiosios visuomenės narius. Na ir veiklo šito centro yra numatytos būtent metodikos algoritmo ir rekomendacijų, kaip būtų galima remiantis užsienio šalių gerąją praktiką, remiantis mūsų ekspertų patirtimi. Toliau labai svarbu, kad galėtumėm užtikrinti, turėtumėm platformą ir galėtumėm užtikrinti, užtikrinti konsultavimą būtent tiek nukentėjusių asmenų, tiek, tiek specialistų arba tiek visuomenės narių, nes kartais e, tikrai, kartais tikrai pasimeta ne, ne tik pas žmogus nukentėjęs, bet pasimeta ir gali pasimesti arba pasimeta kiti asmenys susidūrę. Na ir aišku, labai svarbu kalbėti apie tai, informuoti visuomenę, informuoti visuomenę apie, apie įvairius klausimus. Na ir žinoma, labai svarbu specializacija, jau šiandien šitas aspektas buvo nekarta paminėtas, tai aš labai sutinku ir pritariu, kad tikrai ir prokuratūro, ir ko gero, ne tik prokuratūroj, Būtų svarbu, kad būtų specialistai, kurie, kurie būtų, na, sakykim, atliktų kitokias, kitokius darbus ir veiklas, kurios yra labai svarbios. Na, ir spręsdami bet kokią, sakykim, bet kokią problemą, tame tarpe ir, ir šitą problemą, jau smurtas artimoje aplinkoje parodė, kad tik bendradarbiaudami mes galime iš tikrųjų kažką padaryti ir padaryti ženklaus. Tai mūsų dėmesys taip pat bus nukreiptas į bendradarbiavimą. Na, tai trumpai gal tiek būtų. Ačiū labai už dėmesį. Ačiū labai daliai. Matau, kad turėtume meiti į pertrauką, bet tikrai dar prašyčiau Kristinos mišinienės tada irgi pristatyti, nes ir ačiū visiems už kantrybę. Truputį mažiau turėsim pertraukos, greičiau ką išgersim, bet tikrai svarbi informacija, Kristina, pristatysim. Aš pabandysiu ačiū. žaibiškai, žaibiškai, kiek įmanoma. E, tai dėkoju tikrai už galimybę čia būti ir ta, tai yra unikal, unikalus momentas, kai galim kalbėti apie e, seksualinę prievartą kaip kaip ginklą karo situacijose, tai aš šiandien atstovauju kovos su prekyba žmonėmis ir išnaudojimų centra ir nežiūrint to, kad mūsų pagrindinė programa yra pagalba nukentėjusiems nuo visokiausių prekybo žmonėmis formų asmenims, tačiau lygiagrečiai daugybę metų, 22 metus teikiama pagalba ir nukentėjusiems nuo seksualinio smurto. Kada mes susidūrėme su tarptautinėje, tau tarptautiniuose konfliktuose nukentėjusiais nuo seksualinio smurto asmenimis, tai ko gero buvo prieš kelis metus, kai plūstelėjo didžiuliai skaičiai asmenų prašančių prieglopščio Lietuvoje, tai teko teikti pagalbą tiek nuo 
pavyzdžiui, Boko Haram nukentėjusių Nigerijoje moterų, Kongo Kinshasos pusėje, baisiai, žiauriai, seksualiai prievartautų sužalotoms moterims, Šri Lankos gyventojoms ir, aišku, jėzidėms. Na, ir prieš, ir visą šitą praktiką mums labai pravertė, kai teko susidurti su situacija, kai Rusija pradėjo savo agresiją prieš Ukrainą ir štai sulaukėme skambučio iš nuostabios, fantastiškos tarptautinės iniciatyvos Rape is a war crime ir labai džiaugiuosi, kad šios iniciatyvos inicijatorės yra ir taip pat čia su mumis ir taip pat kalbės, tai šitas mūsų draugystės su šita tarptautinė iniciatyva įsivaizduojat moterys teisininkės tarptautiniai arenoje susivienijo ir nusprendė, kad turi kažką daryti. Tai mes buvom pakviestos teikti praktinę pagalbą nukentėjusioms moterims, pradžioje galvojom, kad tik moterims, paskiau pamatėm, kad tai bus taip pat ir vyrai. Ir štai šių metų vasarą pradėjome tokį nedidelį, pusantrų metų trukmės projektėlį, kuris apima visą pusišką, ten psichologinę, teisinę, finansinę, medicinę pagalbą aukoms nukentėjusioms nuo karo pradžios Ukrainoje. Karo pradžia tai Tai ne 2014 metai, bet paskaičiavome 2022 metus. Iš pradžių užsibrėžėme, kad padėsime šimtui nukentėjusių aukų ir paskiau išsigandome tiek daug, tiek daug, iš kur mes jas rasime, tačiau nuo vasaros pradžios jau turime iš atrinktų, ten suradome apie šiuo metu jau 40 moterų, mūsų pagalba priemi 22, ir o dar tik tai nuo vasaros pradžios teikiam pagalbą, tai aš manau, kad vienas iš tokių projekto atradimų buvo tai, kad pamatėme, jog šitos saukos yra šalia mūsų visiškai šalia mūsų, mūsų bendruomenėse. Jos, aišku, nevaikšto su etiketėmis ant kaktų, kad štai aš esu seksualinio smurtauką, tačiau jos yra šalia mūsų ir dėl įvairiausių migracinių momentų, taip pat dėl tokių psichologinių momentų, kuriuos nepaprastai teisingai Pone pramila patent pastebėjo dėl baimės būt atstumtom, nesuprastom, pasmerktom jos stylį, jos nepasakoje ir jos ne tik, kad šalia mūsų yra, tačiau jos ir labai kenčia. O kenčia dėl, pirmiausia, pamatėme dėl labai blogos psichinės, psichologinės būsenos. Ir... Aišku, čia galbūt ne ta vieta, kur mums labai nagrinėti kažkokius migracinius momentus, tačiau pamatėme tam tikrus kelius, kai moteris atvyksta bent į mūsų šalį, ne per kažkokius ten registracijos centrus, bet jos atvyksta tiesiai pas kažkokį konkrėtų darbdą vidirbti. Nemaža dalim jos tampa ir darbinio išnaudojimo aukomis. Jos nesideklaruoja savaldybėse, kaip mes įsivaizduojam, kad jos deklaruosi savaldybėse ir galės gauti visą paketą pagalbos. Jos to nepadaro dėl vairiausių priežasčių ir dėl to negauna gydimo medicinės pagalbos. Tai atradom ne tik tai, ten depresijai vairiausių laipsnių, bet sunku patikėti, tačiau atradom moteris, kurios su psichotiniais sutrikimais gyvena, dirba ir gyvena kažkaip tai. Na, kitas momentas, kurį pamatėme pradėjusios teikti pagalbą, kad bent Europoje turime labai daug žinių apie tai, kaip dirbti su seksualinio smurto aukomis iš konfliktų zonų, Tai to tikrai anksčiau, to aš net pati nebuvau pastebėjusi, daugybė akademikų, nevyriausybinių organizacijų turi sukaupę milžinišką bagažą žinių, tiesiog reikia ieškoti kažkokių platformų, bendrų susitikimų, debatų, kad mes galėtumėme keistis tomi žiniomis. Nes galbūt tos šalys, kurios, na, tokios jaunės, nešviežesnės, mažiau turi patirties, jos tarsi dviratį išradinėja ir labai daug laiko sugaištame, kad kažką suvokti, 
suvokti apie patrauminio sutrikimo sindromą, taip toliau, tačiau galime dalintis tomis žiniomis. Ir taip pat galbūt tų žinių trūksta ne tik tai, kažkur tai ten labai aukštai, bet ko gero žinių mums labai trūksta ir savivaldybių, ir bendruomenių lygmenių. Nes iš to, kaip mes nepastebėm iš tų moterų, kaip mes nesuprantom, tai kodėl jinai negali atsikelti ir septintą valandą ryto pradėti darbą, kodėl jinai nuola ten kambarėlį su tamsiom užuolaidom ir niekur neišėina ir su nieko nekalba. Tai ko gero mums tokiu pačiu Pačiu žemiausių bendruomeninių lygmenių labai trūksta žinių apie traumą, apie tai, kad mes truputėlį specifiškiau turime elgti su aukomis. Taip pat man šiandien labai patiko ta mintis gerbiamos pramilos apie baimę, apie atstumimo baimę, bet tą atstumimo baimę mes matome ne vien tik tai tokių individualių lygmenių, kad štai kas bus, kai mano vyras sužinos, kas bus, kai sužinos mano ten kažkokie kaimynai apie tai, kas man atsitiko. Bet dėje Ukrainos atveju mes matome šitą baimę ne tokių bendruomeninių lygmenių, kai daug samprotaujama ir galvojama, kad o jeigu bendruomenė sužinos apie tai, kas man atsitiko, ar tai nesumažins kažkokios tai kovinės dvasios, ar tai mano visos šeimos nepadarys kažkokio stigmatizuotą šeimą, tai aš manau, kad mums tai irgi pakankamai nauja ir mes turėtumėm suprasti, kodėl bendruomeninių lygmenių ta atstumimo baimė yra tokia labai stipri ir kodėl galbūt mes patys ir sukurėtumėm kuriame tą atstumimą. Na ir aš galvoju, kad labai norėčiau tokia pasidalinti, žinote, aišku, jūs visi esat specialistai, galbūt su platesne visuomenė apie tai, kad kaip mum padaryti, kad visi tie pažadai apie darbo grupės, tyrimų atžvilgą, aš čia kalbu apie tyrimus, apie teisinio to teisingumo atstatymą, kad jie taptų realus. Bent iš tų atvejų, su kuriais mes dirbame, aš nematau jokių prošvaiščių, kad šitos moteris konkrečiai galėtų pasakoti, kreiptis pagalbos. Moteris iš Hersono, Dnipro, Vinicos, Harkovo, Izumo, Rivnos, visos tos moteris, kurios šalia mūsų gyvena, jos netiki, kad gali būti tas teisingumas pasiektas ir kaip mum padaryti, kad jos patikėtų mumis. Bet iš tikrųjų iš to seka kitas klausimas, ar mes turime, realiai turime instrumentus tam teisingumui pasiekti, gal mes čia tik save turime, raminame kažkuria prasme, kad štai mes nuteisime, nubausime. Tai šitas klausimas mum praktikam yra labai svarbus, nes mes turime atsakyti jį. Ne konferencijose, ne kažkur pastarimuose, bet žiūrėdamus šito moterim niekis mes turim pasakyti, ar tau verta prakalbt, ar bus tas teisingumas, ar nebus taip, kad tu prakalbsi kažkas kėstels rankoms ir pasakys, kad dėja negalima surinkti įrodymų. Ir taip pat tas momentas, kuris galbūt štai mes jau ir kelintą dieną matome ir kitoje pasaulio dalyje baisius veiksmus prieš moteris ir matome taip pat, kad prie vartautojai, kankintojai, žalotojai, jie sveikinami kaip nugalėtojai, tą matom ir Ukrainos taip pat atveju, su gėlėmis pasitinkami savo šalyse, kad jie iš tikrųjų kentėtų, o ne šitos moteris, mergaitės, beje vyrai ir berniukai, taip pat sėdėtų tamsuose kambariuose, užsutraukė užuolaidas ir galvotų, kad gyvenimas baigtas. Tai, nežinau, mum praktikam tai yra labai svarbu. Ir ačiū. Ačiū, Kristinai, labai atsiprašau, nespėjome šiandien Redos Jūra Levičiūtės išklausyti pristatymo, bet reikės matyti suorganizuoti, įrašyti, kadangi Reda galėjo būti nuotolių, kad galėtumėm pasidalinti su visais kartu su šitos konferencijos įrašų. O dabar tada greitai kavos visi, pertrauka ir tada 15-15 antra dalis seksualinis smurtas karo kontekste ir diskusijabus. Tai už penkių minučių tada. Penkias minutės greitai kas ir 15-20. Ačiū iki.
Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome everyone back to our main venue. I apologize for the shortness of the coffee break. I heard you had very interesting discussions, but uh, I'd like to invite my uh, co-panelists here uh, on stage. Um, we're still waiting for uh, a few. Meanwhile, I uh, may introduce myself. My name is Inga Martinkuta. I'm an um, advocate and uh, I'm one of the initiator of um, the information campaign Rape is a War Crime in Lithuania. I, uh, I met wonderful people who joined the forces, including both Kristinas from the European Institute and from Comsi Center. And uh, I hope that the current event also will raise the awareness of intolerance to the uh, sexual violence, especially in the conflict zones. It is my absolute pleasure to invite our Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Mr. Gabrielus Landsbergis, to open our panel and uh, share his insights on the international uh, arena on this uh, very uh, sensitive but also important issue. Please. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, first of all, let me thank for the honor to open this part of, of our discussion. Uh, as we discuss sexual violence in conflict, Russia's brutal aggression against Ukraine is a case in point. Sexual violence figures prominently on the list of crimes the Russian armed forces have been committing against civilian population in the temporarily occupied parts of Ukraine. I applaud the special representative of the UN Secretary General, uh, Ms. Pramila Patton, for relentlessly bringing this to the world's attention. We're hoping that she will be able to join us. Uh, countless Ukrainians have been suffering a widespread pattern of torture, inhuman and degrading treatment and other violations of international humanitarian and human rights law committed by Russian authorities, which amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. Sexual violence, mostly against women and girls, constitutes a significant part of that pattern. It is obvious that Russia's brutal, an unprovoked military aggression in Ukraine has caused yet another humanitarian crisis, disproportionately affecting women and girls. Yet a huge scale and an unprecedented recurrence of sexual violence inflicted in Ukraine hint at a systemic use of sexual violence and rape as a weapon. The United Nations Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine and the Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine have documented and reported sexual violence as a form of torture and inhuman treatment against civilians and prisoners of war by Russian armed forces. Russia-affiliated armed groups and Russian law enforcement authorities. The cruelty is shocking. The victims of rape ranged from 4 to over 80 years of age, and the perpetrators raped women and girls in some cases in front of family members, while in others, husbands or partners were killed. Regrettably, sexual crimes were often underreported under -reported due to existing fear and stigma, thus the real numbers of the victims in Ukraine are likely much higher. The Russian war of aggression against Ukraine also triggered a large-scale displacement, which led to increased risk risks of trafficking for the purposes of sexual ex exploitation in the region. Russia has been attacking healthcare centers in Ukraine, and the aggression has severely disrupted access to livelihood opportunities and basic services, including life-saving, sexual, and reproductive healthcare and information. The perpetrators must be held to account. Russia must pay for the damages caused by its war. Therefore, we support the work of the Independent International Commission of Inquiry in Ukraine, the work of the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine, and relevant UN Special Pro Procedure mandate holders. The investigation into the situation in the occupied territories of Ukraine by the International Criminal Court, the okay, or the International Center of, for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression Against Ukraine, the establishment of the Register of Damage. We are also calling for the establishment of an international special tribunal on the crime of aggression against Ukraine. 
The scale of Russia's aggression, as well as its global consequences, make it imperative that we find a way to hold those responsible for violating rules and norms of international law accountable on international level. Victims deserve justice and redress. We should ensure that they have access to multi-sectoral services, justice and reparations for survivors of conflict-related sexual violence. We should be addressing the issue of sexual violence in conflict also within the framework of women, peace and security agenda. Lithuania remains commit committed to women, peace and security agenda implementation, both nationally and internationally. Lithuania has been continuously supporting the Women, Peace and Humanitarian Fund since its launch in 2016. We closely cooperate with women rights NGOs in Ukraine, seeking to provide humanitarian aid in response to women, women's and girls' needs in the country and Ukrainian refugees abroad. I take this opportunity to pledge once again that Lithuania, also as a current member of the UN Human Rights Council and incoming chair of a committee of ministers of the Council of Europe, will continue consistently prioritizing the rights of the child and full enjoyment of human rights by women and girls denouncing all forms of violence against women, children around the world, and supporting Ukraine in face of the unprovoked, brutal aggression until its full victory. I thank you. Thank you very much for your attention, for your time today. And I'd like to invite uh, our online participant, uh, Ms. Oksana Zolnovich, Minister of Social Policy in Ukraine. She will address us uh, online. Please, if uh, we have her online. Yes, the screen is all yours. Uh, please go ahead. Доброго дня. Дякую за можливість сьогодні долучитися. Чи чути мене добре? Чи чутно мене? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Дякую. Отже, насамперед, хочу подякувати за організацію такого важливого заходу. Дякую за те, що піднімаєте справді важливі для України і українців питання, які сьогодні торкаються наших громадян і е, того всього, що відбувається в нашій державі у зв'язку з повномасштабним вторгненням. Також щиро дякую і уряду Литви, і всьому народові за ту підтримку, яку ви надали впродовж всього повномасштабного вторгнення, зокрема, і фізичну підтримку, і моральну, і психологічну, і матеріальну підтримку в якості різної, різної, різної допомоги. Сьогоднішнє обговорення є також одним з дуже важливих аспектів, бо, на жаль, сексуальне насильство під час війни стало не просто елементом військових дій, можливо, таким випадковим побічним явищем, яке є в багатьох країнах, але цілеспрямованою стратегією російської армії – задля знищення українців як таких, задля того, щоб провадити геноцид проти нашого народу. Оскільки ми бачимо величезну кількість проявів такого насильства із відповідним супроводом. Це і тортури сексуального характеру, жахливі тортури, зокрема з під'єднанням струму до статевих органів, і про такі випадки свідчать вже дуже багато людей, що побували в полоні. Це і травмування чи каріцтво відповідно статевих органів. Це зґвалтування з супроводом, щоб ніколи в тебе не було дітей, і ти ніколи не більше не могла народити, що вже само по собі теж є додатково жахливим. Це і величезна кількість сексуальних злочинів і примушувань до статевих актів під страхом Смерті, за, смерті ушкодження здоров'я, страхом за власних рідних, чи, чи під якимось іншим примусом, коли люди просто не здатні чинити супротив агресору. Це і інші дії сексуального характеру, такі як примуси до оголення, примусове роздягання на всіх блокпостах, де люди просто хочуть виїхати з зони бойових дій і врятуватися. Всі ці речі... Є елементами злочину, є сексуально зумовленим насильством. Вони всі, відповідно, класифікуються як злочини сексуального характеру. І, звісно, вони всі підлягають покаранню. Але, на жаль, як вже було сказано, поки у нас не так багато свідчень задокументованих, які б свідчили про 
кількість такого сексуального насильства. Зазвичай це оповіді е, свідків з боку або інших близьких людей, які знають про те, що людина постраждала від сексуального насильства. Самі ж особи, що постраждали, дуже часто поки не готові з різних міркувань. І через психологічний стрес, і через намагання просто забути все те, витіснити з пам'яті, що з нею сталося, з нею чи з ним. І через страх за інших рідних, які ще знаходяться на окупованих територіях, не готові говорити про факти сексуального насильства. Разом з тим, за даними Офісу Генерального прокурора, Станом на вересень цього року нами зафіксовано 231 факт сексуального насильства, пов'язаного з збройним конфліктом. З них, зокрема, 142 щодо жінок, 82 щодо чоловіків і 13 щодо дітей. Зокрема, і щодо маленьких дітей, по суті, зовсім, зовсім маленьких. І це теж додатковий жах, з яким ми зустрічаємося в, в нашій державі. Також ми розуміємо, що це зовсім не репрезентативні дані, що таких випадків є набагато більше, що дуже багато людей ще знаходяться на окупованих територіях, е, які страждають від сексуально зумовленого насильства. І, очевидно, нам повна картина, особливо цієї категорії злочинів, е, проявиться набагато пізніше. Разом з тим ми вже працюємо над тим, щоби Провадити ефективну національну систему реагування на сексуально зумовлене насильство в результаті конфлікту, щоб мати можливість ефективно розслідувати такі злочини, щоб мати можливість виявляти їх, тому що дуже багато людей, які постраждали, вже виїхали за кордон і знаходяться на теренах Європейського Союзу, щоб була також співпраця із іншими органами правоохоронними тих країн, якщо в системі соціальної підтримки кожної з європейських країн з'ясовується, що людина по постраждала від сексуального насильства з умовленого конфлікту. І також ми все робимо для того, щоб сьогодні в себе в Україні забезпечити максимально необхідну і фізичну, і психологічну допомогу, в тому числі з точки зору здоров'я, з точки зору психосоціальної підтримки для всіх громадян, які постраждали від такого насильства. Найважливіше, звісно, над чим ми зараз працюємо, це активна, якісна міжсекторальна взаємодія, щоб на всіх етапах і на всіх рівнях ми мали можливість підхоплювати людину, що постраждала від сексуального насильства, і забезпечити їй цю допомогу, якої вона потребує. І в цьому контексті я хочу відзначити як вагомий плюс, як вагому допомогу підписання в червні цього, минулого року рамкової програми співробітництва між урядом України і Організацією об'єднаних націй, щодо запобігання і протидії сексуальному насильству, в результаті якого ми вже розробили відповідний національний імплементаційний план, створили необхідну міжвідомчу робочу групу, продовжуємо далі напрацьовувати необхідні документи для того, щоб максимально забезпечити взаємодію між різними органами, міжнародними і неурядовими організаціями, що сьогодні активно допомагають нашій державі в підтримці тих громадян, що постраждали від сексуально зумовленого конфлікту. Які елементи імплементаційного плану сьогодні ми бачимо, чи визначили це, зокрема, підтримка і зміцнення національної політики, також надання комплексної допомоги постраждалим, обов'язково правосуддя і притягнення до відповідальності в найбільш екологічний для людини спосіб, щоб повторно не травмувати постраждалих, також посилення спроможності сектору безпеки і оборони, щоб запобігати і протидіяти сексуальному насильству на майбутнє. І, звісно, одним з найбільш важливих механізмів є дизайн механізму репарацій і компенсацій для тих наших громадян, які постраждали від сексуального насильства в результаті конфлікту. Перше чергове завдання міністерства нашого – оскільки Міністерство визначено головним координатором щодо вироблення і формування політики протидії і запобіганню сексуальному насильству, що зумовлено військовим конфліктом, є пошук швидких рішень. І такими швидкими рішеннями, без сумніву, є екстрена медична, психологічна і соціальна допомога. Для цього ми повністю переорієнтували всю нашу мережу спеціалізованих служб підтримки, яка в основному була розгорнута для протидії домашньому насильству і насильству за ознакою статі, ввели туди відповідні навчання, 
додаткових фахівців, щоб зробити фокус також на сексуальному насильстві в результаті конфлікту. Маємо таких майже 300 закладів по всій країні, і що дуже ефективно, завдяки в тому числі співпраці з міжнародними партнерами, розгорнули роботу більше 500, 500 мобільних бригад, які показують сьогодні ну, хорошу ефективність і хороший рівень допомоги нашим громадянам, особливо в тих територіях, які дуже наближені до бойових дій, які є близько в зоні конфлікту і де немає можливості розгортати стаціонарні шелтери чи притулки. Також за ініціативою нашої віце-прем'єрки Ольги Стефанішиної з питань євроінтеграції, також підтримки фонду ООН, ми вже розгорнули у великих містах 11 центрів допомоги врятованим, які спеціалізовано спрямовані на комплексну допомогу і підтримку саме для постраждалих від сексуального насильства, пов'язаного з війною, і надають відповідну комплексну допомогу всім тим, хто туди звертається в такий дуже зручний, ненав'язливий спосіб, що дозволяє людям розкриватися і не відчувати стигматизації або якихось внутрішніх перепон для того, щоб отримувати таку допомогу. Так само для підтримки дітей, бо, як я вже сказала, на жаль, серед тих, що є постраждалими від сексуального насильства, є багато дітей. Ми впроваджуємо модель Барнахус по всіх великих містах, вже діє у Вінниці, Києві, Миколаєві, Тернополі, Дніпрі, розгортаються і в інших містах. І, звісно, як ми всі розуміємо, центр Барнахус є дуже важливим механізмом, щоб насамперед допомогти дитині, дати свідчення, допомогти зафіксувати цей злочин, допомогти також надати їй необхідну психосоціальну підтримку і виявити потребу дитині в різного роду підтримці, але разом з тим не травмувати її повторно величезною кількістю різних слідчих дій і величезною кількістю опитувань, які за собою несе традиційний кримінальний процес. Також важливою складовою протидії сексуально замовленому насильству, є інформування громадян про права таких постраждалих, про ту підтримку, яку вони можуть отримати, про ті напрями допомоги, яку вони можуть отримати, зокрема через інформування членів родин постраждалих, свідків, інших людей, що можуть таку інформацію поширювати. І тому в Україні працює платформа допомоги врятованим, де вже тисячі громадян ознайомились з різними доступними сьогодні сервісами. Також розроблено буклети інформаційні, що дають можливість побачити, як карається сексуальне насильство, що це таке, з яких аспектів воно також походить, що ми можемо вважати сексуальним насильством. Тому що дуже багато громадян, якщо вони не чинили опір в силу страху за своє життя, вважають, що їх не зґвалтували і що вони не мають права звернутися за допомогою, але, звісно, це не так, тому ми намагаємося всіма можливими способами доносити людям, постраждалим, про те, що будь-яка форма примусу до інтимних стосунків є сексуальним насильством, це карається, і це також є аспектом, що зумовлює комплекс підтримки для такої людини, яка піддана була такому насильству. Зокрема, Розповсюджуються ці буклети через центри безоплатної правничої допомоги, які в нас в Україні широко розгалужені, бо така допомога є також одним з елементів підтримки наших громадян України. Це коротко набір тих речей, які сьогодні в Україні роблять заради того, щоб підтримати наших громадян, що постраждали від сексуального насильства. Зареєстровано законопроект про репарації і виплату компенсацій в результаті сексуально зумовленого насильства. Я думаю, що Верховна Рада над ним плідно попрацює, і ми матимемо цілісний механізм поки швидкої підтримки наших громадян, а далі ми впевнені, що, на жаль, інформація про кількість злочинів у нас буде збільшуватися і нам потрібно вже сьогодні мати розширену мережу готових фахівців, щоб ще впродовж багатьох років підтримувати тих постраждалих, які щодня страждають і ще можуть бути такими, що постраждали на окупованих територіях, є під загрозою такого насильства. Відповідно, і міжнародний розголос в цьому питанні є надзвичайно важливим, щоб системно формувати політику і допомогти Україні впоратися з тими викликами, які сьогодні перед нами стоять. Тож ще раз дякую за можливість долучитися до 
такого важливого обговорення і за те, що ви пріоритизуєте проблеми України і проблеми громадян України, в тому числі і в рамках е, протидії сексуально зумовленому насильству. Дякую. Thank I hope you can hear applause from the audience for um, uh, dear uh, uh, Oksana Zolnovich. I think uh, it's uh, an illustration of uh, the approach that we are trying to implement that is like uh, uh, the support oriented towards the victim and actually we should be hearing and we should be speaking with ukrainians hearing what do they need what those victims need and trying to uh, reflect and respond to those needs uh, on the ground in the field uh, in the same way i'd like to invite member of ukrainian parliament miss larisa bilogir to continue of uh, what are the needs of uh, uh, the victims and survivors of the uh, conflict-related sexual violence in Ukraine. Thank you. The floor is yours. Dear friends, dear Ukrainian friends, international friends, dear colleagues, it's a pleasure for me to be with you today uh, when we are talking on such a uh, important issue, finding the ways of solving the consequences. So of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I see that the Gabriel Dislandberg is, is not here, but I wanted to, to thank to him because I'm now from the with you from the PACE, uh, from the Parliament of the Council of Europe, where we adopted a lot of good historical resolutions. And we really heard everybody, all 46 members, parliamentarians heard his statement that he said that he called on the international community to keep the focus on Ukraine and its fight against the Russian invasion amid the uh, escalation and amid the uh, awful tragedies in Israel. And I want to thank also the Minister of Social Affairs, uh, uh, Monika uh, Navicenia, for um, initiating this meeting and uh, in initiating establishment of a new center dedicated to solving the problems of uh, sexual violence. Um, I'm also the member, I'm a parliamentarian and I am the member of the uh, temporary commission on uh, uh, investigating the uh, sexual violence cases uh, mm, or committed by the Russian soldiers against uh, Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian civilians, children, and even uh, war prisoners. And uh, today I would like to share with you um, our conclusions and to share with you uh, also the, the, the draft laws that we have uh, submitted to uh, our parliament recently. And uh, it's good to be where online with our uh, minister, uh, I'm sorry, do you hear, hear me? It's just interruption, yeah. Uh, with our Minister of Social Affairs. And um, uh, of course, uh, it is uh, very uh, uh, important to investigate all these uh, cases. And we understand that it's not only 231. We can understand uh, our even prosecutors' uh, cases we, uh, say that it can be 10 times more, but uh, people ask, uh, usually it takes a lot of time if you take the experience from Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Albania, um, in Colombia, we have like, uh, uh, it takes years, it takes years uh, to, 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 to register and for people to to overleave uh, uh, the, the problems. And actually for, from us as a parliamentarians and uh, the also government, it is very important to uh, adopt already the all the laws that will make this register and the compensation mechanism and the status and uh, all these issues in place. Because in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it was only 20, 20 years when they did adopted the law that made this register possible. So for us, we can't wait. And for us, it's very, very important to do this. So we already registered uh, three draft laws um, uh, um, following the conclusions of our temporary commission. 
uh, in Verkhovna Rada. One is uh, on, uh, um, uh, I will not tell you the numbers, but uh, it's on the status and the uh, register and the reparation. And then the other uh, one on the budget code. So we have to create the special, um, uh, um, uh, in a special budget uh, fund uh, where we can accumulate the money. Actually, uh, with the money and with such a support of, of, of international partners, it's not a problem. There are organizations already. It can be reparations. Of course, it will be when the, the court of uh, tribunal will be established. And actually, I'm here in Pace and uh, our uh, team and our Lithuanian friends, uh, for example, uh, the head of your delegation, doing everything to, to uh, for the Council of Europe on, or, or, and the international community to establish uh, this uh, this uh, tribunal, it, it surely will be. We acknowledge Russia to be a dictatorship. We acknowledge Putin to be a dictator, uh, and it, 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 Russia is a terrorism uh, regime. And we actually working on the mechanism, and the register is already uh, in place. But we also have to uh, understand that we can do it in Ukraine also, and there are money for this. But we have to be capable in Ukraine to create this mechanism. That's why I address also the other Minister of uh, Social Affairs. It is we have to uh, we have these laws in place, but we need a polit in political will and support. And of course, I know they are now keen on preparing all these mechanisms how to make this repair. Because when we will have funds, and when people will know that we'll have, they will have the reparations, either from Russia, it will be later, but if it's uh, from the funds, international funds that are already ready in, in place to give this money, then people will be more willing to register these crimes because it's a re-victimization and it's a great tragedy for these people. And just to know, to go all through this process, it's very difficult. So we also registered um, amendments to the changes to the uh, articles of uh, uh, criminal uh, procedure in court, and it's in place. So um, it just uh, the, the, um, we have to adopt these laws and not to wait like Bosnia waited for twenty years and do it now. So um, what I wanted to say that we have done a, a big big work. It's very sad. It's very uh, um, moving and actually uh, talking with all these people uh, that were um, um, uh, as as the minister said that the children from four to 80 uh, for children till 80 year old lady and even the the uh, war prisoners so it's uh, a, a it's this is not war, a word from horror book and this is already uh, cases that are reg registered so we do appreciate um uh, what you're doing for us and we'll, when we will be together on creating the mechanism because we can talk for this for long but it's it's Already in places, all the laws. Actually, uh, I have seen here the, the, the there is a representative of uh, UN special um, representative sexual violence in conflict from UN, and actually we worked this laws also and took all the amendments um, from the secretary of UN special um, um, representative office representative on uh, in conflicts of sexual violence. So it's very good laws, very concrete, but they need money they need will a mechanism within ukraine and uh, we need not to wait but to do it as soon as possible so uh, we would like you to join this initiative and be a, a supervisor also because lithuania is really active i'm telling you that here with the baltic flood country this lithuania we do a lot in in council of europe and even in this group baltic plus we already have like Britain and, and and France joining us. So uh, we, we're really thankful for initiating this this um, uh, this meeting. And uh, believe me, we have everything in place, draft laws, the conclusion of temporary commission. And uh, uh, I think it's just the, the matter of effective, uh, capable uh, cooperation uh, and just work instead of, uh, you know, when now uh, we are having, um, you know, this tragedy in Israel, uh, the, the, the focus, as your minister told the foreign affairs, has shifted. But nobody's telling that in Ukraine now we had a severe offensive from the Russian side and it's like severe um, 
attacks uh, with 100,000 troops, Russian troops, only in one direction in Avdiivka. So uh, please keep our issue, keep our Ukrainian issue on the on the table of international community. And again, thank you for everybody for such a great support, especially for Lithuania that in front of all these uh, issues uh, that are so important, for, uh, especially the sexual violence uh, and uh, committed by the Russian so soldiers in Ukraine. And the, the main uh, uh, thing, the justice must be restored. Impunity is impossible. So together with you, I'm sure we will um, do everything to, for justice to be in place for the people that suffered from the sexual violence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Larissa Bilozhir, member of Ukrainian parliament. Uh, it's only a third uh, speaker on our panel, but we are already hearing uh, wonderful ideas and discussions that are answering what Christina was asking in the panel before. What do we offer to those survivors? And here it is, a national mechanism, administrative mechanism that certifies, verifies the event, the sexual violence, uh, and grants special rights or entitlements for the victims and survivors. And it's not a judicial process. It does not have to uh, undergo kind of judicial hearing. It's just an administrative mechanism that can be offered by a state. And all the compensations and reparations, if they will be paid for the victims and survivors, they will count towards the overall damage done by by Russian aggression in Ukraine. And when the time comes, there could be a retro uh, direction, uh, kind of compensation of those damages from the Russian uh, funds held in the central banks uh, somewhere in Switzerland or uh, uh, other Western European countries. So there are practical ways how to address uh, this helplessness of the victims. And uh, here is the example of it. And with that, I'd like now to invite uh, again Ms. Pramila Patton to kind of continue what are the international mechanisms, what uh, are other options for cooperation, for improved international uh, uh, legislation or norm creation to uh, fight the uh, impunity of those crimes. Uh, well, please. Th thank you, thank you, Inga. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to participate in this round table and to share with you the work of my office uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, I must say that uh, Ukraine is, is different to my other 20 to 25 conflict countries where usually uh, <clears throat> it is a crime that's brushed under the carpet even by, uh, by, by governments who in those conflict countries, governments are also perpetrators. You have state and non-state actors. But in the context of Ukraine, uh, I mean, like, I don't know whether you are aware of this, like a few days, I think it was three days, three to four days, that the first reports of sexual violence surfaced and the foreign minister and the prime minister spoke about it very publicly and, and sent a very strong signal that sexual violence used as a tactic of war will not be tolerated. And, and for me, that's a paradigm shift. And, and the, the government of Ukraine has shown unflinching political will to, uh, to, to, to come back to prevent and to address conflict-related sexual violence. This year, in the midst of an active war, uh, the president organized a, a conference in March in, in Lviv, United for Justice, uh, an international conference. Like he got a think tank, a group of people to come and reflect on, on how to pursue uh, justice for victims of the crime of aggression of, 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 uh, of the Russian Federation. And there was one dedicated session 
on conflict-related sexual violence. From the perspective of my office, I engaged very early with the government. It, for me, it was important uh, to, to, to go there and to send a strong signal to the perpetrators that the world is watching and that they will not get away with it. And also to send a message of solidarity to the Ukrainian people, but to the survivors of sexual violence that uh, uh, the United Nations stand with them and to urge them to, uh, to actually report, because I know how difficult it, how underreporting can, uh, will, will, will ease the calculation of the perpetrators. They know that this crime will not be reported. So for me, it was important to go out there and speak to the survivors and to tell them, listen, your silence will be their license to continue and, 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 and rape. And uh, so my engagement started immediately, uh, Mar March, and we, start, we worked uh, virtually on, on an agreement where the government of U Ukraine identified the areas where it needs the support of the UN. And on, on the 3rd of May, I signed an agreement, which the minister just mentioned, with the deputy prime minister, a framework of cooperation on prevention and response to conflict-related sexual violence under five main pillars, justice and accountability, legislative reform, holistic services to survivors of sexual violence, security sector reform, and trafficking uh, in person for the purpose of sexual exploitation. And legislative reform had a very special focus on, rep on reparations. And uh, usually I would deploy, after signing, I would deploy a technical team that was not possible for security reasons, but we worked really well together virtually. And uh, we targeted the Deputy Prime Minister and I that we launched the implementation plan during the UN General Assembly, which we did. And uh, that implementation plan was, was launched with an uh, interministerial task force with five subgroups addressing each of the, of the pillar. Uh, and I, I, I co-chair with the Deputy Prime Minister that, that interministerial committee. And just to tell you that this year, during the UN General Assembly, we had a side event to mark the one year of the implementation plan to assess progress. And I'm very pleased to report that as far as the implementation of the agreement is concerned, it's going very smoothly. What we are doing concretely is like, one, we have a, a very, very big project over two years. One project is precisely about providing that holistic services uh, to survivors of sexual violence uh, under all the pillars, bringing together six UN agencies from UN Women to UNFPA to World Health Organization, UNODC dealing with trafficking, UNDP and, and IOM. Uh, that's the services part, uh, uh, working together with survivors, working together with NGOs uh, at, at community level. And on justice and accountability front, we uh, suggested very early to the Office of the Prosecutor General that they have a dedicated uh, uh, specialized unit on, on sexual violence within the Office of the Prosecutor General. And the Prosecutor General was very receptive to the idea. And as early as October of last year, that specialized unit was established. And my team of experts on the rule of law is working very, very closely uh, with the, uh, the specialized unit, uh, deploying expertise into the specialized unit, uh, uh, deploying uh, 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 capacity uh, into the uh, uh, office of, uh, uh, of the deputy prime minister that is responsible to oversee the implementation of the, of the agreement. We have deployed capacity into the human rights the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission to, to enhance, to bolster their own capacity to document cases of sexual violence because we consider that uh, their capacity is also limited, but there's, there's also security constraints, there's access constraints. Uh, we are deploying senior women protection advisors uh, in, in Ukraine uh, that will be located in the office of the resident coordinator, uh, in the of, in UN Women, 
Commission, in UNFPA, in OHCHR, to oversee uh, implementation. The first, uh, we, we started workshop that we are holding in Sheshov in, in Poland for investigators and prosecutors. So we, we've done three rounds of workshops and the next one will be in December. And my team of experts uh, just deployed in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Kyiv and they, they, they returned last night actually. So we, we are training investigators, local investigators from the Oblast, uh, uh, the heads of uh, the, the, the prosecutors, uh, because that, that's, that's really critical to build their capacity. And that, the program has been really built with the participation of the prosecutor general himself, the uh, person uh, in, in, the, uh, in the specialized uh, unit. Uh, we, uh, we have plans to, uh, uh, to, to deploy more uh, capacity into the, uh, into the specialized unit to deal with trauma management, uh, to deal with children, because they, we are increasingly seeing a, a large number of uh, children victims of sexual violence, that where you require a very specialized, very specialized skill set to interview a child, uh, and in order not to re-victimize, what you have mentioned about risk of re-victimization. And it is all scenario-based training that we are doing with the investigators investigators and, and the prosecutors. And that really is, is, is something that I want to flag to the uh, earlier panelist, uh, the Office of the Prosecutor General, who was talking about having to be, to be balanced. No, uh, sexual, sexual violence, especially conflict-related sexual violence, requires very, very specialized uh, uh, expertise. That, that's one. Uh, Second point that I want to, 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 to make now to you as refugee receiving countries, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, and, and, and immediately after my first visit in, uh, uh, my visit in Ukraine last year in May and this year in March, I, w I have been visiting refugee receiving countries to really make the point that the victims of sexual violence are not reporting in Ukraine. Firstly, because of the security. The priority is to flee. Uh, then you have access constraints because the, the institutions are really not there on, a, on account of, of, of the war. We know how, what kind of damage uh, the medical infrastructure has su suffered with the targeting of, with the deliberate targeting of medical infrastructure. We know that there's also of course, profound shame and, 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 and stigma, uh, but also lack of trust in the judicial institutions in, in, uh, in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, and I have met, when, when I was there in, in May, I met with many NGOs. It was a very, very big meeting with NGOs. I met with mothers, families of victims who said, my daughter was raped, but she left. And I, at the time, they didn't even know where. They had no, no uh, and they had no idea about reporting. And, and the NGOs were saying that as soon as an area is liberated, they would do door to door, and they would say in every house, the stories were the same. Someone had been raped, but they said these, these women are not are not, are not reporting. So that's why it's important in the refugee receiving countries that you create a space because that's, that's what's required, that conducive environment. People will not walk into a police station in Lithuania or Estonia or Latvia to say, I was raped in Ukraine. It doesn't work like that. And I was like very impressed when I was in Latvia to see uh, the first lady referred me to uh, uh, an NGO working with uh, refugees from Ukraine, and they were doing a remarkable job, and, and they invited me to, to, to give me a taste of it. And I was nice building, very well equipped building, but I was invited into the kitchen. I sat with a group of women. I was not the Under Secretary General of the United Nations. I was just a woman sitting there talking to, and there were Ukrainian women, they were baking cookies and we were having coffee and we were talking and they opened up. 
And that has been the, 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 the way this NGO has been working, through knitting classes, through baking classes, cooking classes. And, and, and they wanted me to, to experience this. And, and I left without saying who I was, except that I work for the United Nations. I'm, I'm a woman speaking to a group of women. That is the conducive environment that's required. And in that NGO, they had their psychologist. They, 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 they had their medical, medical service. And that NGO is funded by, by the government. I mean, like I was in Estonia where I visited a school for, for, for adolescent children who would have been on, the, unaccompanied minors from 12 to 7, 16, who would have been on the street uh, if it was not for that school. And it, 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 was, it, was, it, was really, it was really great. So I think this is an opportunity to learn from, 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 from each other. Uh, but what I can say is that the, the challenges are huge in Ukraine. The displacement is 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 massive. Uh, the needs, I mean, like the the resources are not commensurate to the gravity of the of the situation. For example, the mental toll uh, on the Ukrainian people as a, as a whole is going to be huge, and I don't think we are investing that kind of of, of money into into mental health. I I, I don't see it. Uh, certainly. I do not have the, the, the resources that I would need to do what I want to do. Uh, the uh, uh, livelihood support that the women and children who have fled uh, or internally displaced in Ukraine need, uh, or even in refugee receiving countries, I don't, I don't see it, and, and I have been flagging, uh, expressing my concern about the risk of this humanitarian crisis turning into a, 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 a trafficking crisis because we know how vulnerable uh, women and children are and how for for predators this is not a, a tragedy this war is an opportunity so i have i just want to end on on that note and and to invite you as refugee receiving countries uh, to to really not lose sight of this crime because it goes undetected and undeterred and uh, uh, the issue to address it we must speak about it and we must make the issue visible and on the radar of law enforcement officials and lack of data or scarcity of data does should in no way be taken to indicate a lack of, of criminal activity. I have done a lot of work since last year with OSC, with IOM, with UNODC, but I just want to leave you with uh, a few recommendations uh, in terms of enhancing protection as well as prosecution. Uh, and I commend Lithuania for some of its efforts in this area, including the establishment of the police by, by the police of an anti-trafficking working group with the appointment of coordinators in the registration centers. But I think it's also important to have robust anti-trafficking legislation, which is a precondition for effective intelligence gathering to improve the response of police border authorities and other security personnel to conduct education and awareness raising campaigns targeting at risk groups. We will share with you our model legislative provision and guidance on investigation and prosecution. We have, we have the, uh, we have copies for, for, for everyone. And I also want to say we are actively working, my team of experts is actively working to roll out the model legislative provision in Ukraine with a focus, as I said, on, on reparations, both interim and, uh, and, and, and long-term uh, reparations. You are absolutely right. Not every, not every survivor will want to walk through the formal criminal justice system, but the system has to work for those who want it, and transitional justice is is the answer. And uh, and and Ukraine, uh, very happy to 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 hear the uh, honourable member of parliament on 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 the legislative reform efforts which my office uh, is supporting. I'll end here. Very happy to respond to any question that you may have. I'll try to reserve some time towards the end. I'm trying to manage the, the timing. Uh, you are very right, uh, uh, you know, 
talking about learning from each other. And I think this uh, forum, this discussion is a, a place to, to share the experience of Latvia, Estonia, and to learn from each other. You know, uh, some aspects might be uh, more successful in one jurisdiction, other aspects in another jurisdiction. So we have to share that experience to learn from each other in order to uh, be able to um, help uh, the, the survivors better. And in that uh, um, mood, I'm inviting Minister of Social Protection of Estonia, Signe Risalo, to address uh, also the, the international uh, cooperation uh, with the, that aim and, and also uh, once again, you know, the, the, the system that Estonia has and how Estonia is uh, dealing with the survivors. Dear, uh, dear participants, I would like to, uh, to add shortly some uh, extra thoughts, maybe. It's uh, understood that sexual violence increases in socially challenging uh, and crisis situations like we, we have many previous times. And continuous work is essential to, to address attitudes towards sexual violence. International cooperation, both at the state and third sector levels, is uh, uh, crucial. Estonia has um, some uh, NGOs or third sector players who uh, has been very successful uh, from the very beginning of the uh, uh, war in Ukraine. Firstly, of course, uh, they help more uh, people to, to flee the um, Ukraine, but uh, now uh, there is more cooperation to, to help victims, including uh, victims of sexual uh, violence. Like I told you uh, before the coffee break, uh, uh, Mondo is one of them uh, who is sharing uh, social, well, is, who is sharing uh, psychosocial um, consulting uh, to, to victims. Um, as sexual violence uh, um, significantly affects an individual's uh, dignity, actions uh, that support victims' uh, self-esteem, confidence and dignity are essential. Attitudes that blame the victims are still prevalent and um, and need to change. The responsibility should be uh, on the preparator, not the victim, which is uh, very often still the case in our societies, especially um, in the middle of, uh, of crisis. And uh, to, to give uh, some sample uh, uh, of statistics in Estonia, in 2022, uh, out of 201 victims, who used uh, the uh, sexual violence crisis centers in Estonia, 190 were women and 11 were men, which means that uh, this is uh, uh, very clear that uh, victims are mainly women and very often, of course, young women and girls who has less uh, experiences to, to protect themselves. Systems developed uh, for support, empowerment, and uh, reintegration must uh, function eff uh, effectively. Changing existing attitudes among professionals is a long and uh, systematic uh, process. Victims often uh, uh, don't seek help due to fear and shame of uh, stigmatization and re-victimization. If they don't seek help, uh, there's a very high risk of uh, untreated trauma, leading to various health issues and, of course, social problems. Uh, it's recommended that victims, uh, in addition to seek crisis services, also seek mental health support uh, for trauma recovery. We should remember that uh, even though the help is available, and we believe that uh, help is uh, out there, Victims are individuals, and very often uh, they do not allow to, to receive the help. Which means that our role is uh, to be uh, more and more proactive, uh, including uh, community activities. We can uh, 
find uh, the victims. Maybe uh, of the three or four sessions in uh, or women's club or, or day center, they are uh, able to open up and uh, talk what happened to them. In Estonia, we have a so-called family nest, uh, which is also evidence-based um, uh, approach uh, internationally known as a family house. This is place for women's uh, parents uh, with uh, small children, preschool age. They can uh, get um, uh, different type of help uh, there, but also just a place to be together and share their uh, problems. In Estonia, as I, I told, uh, all the uh, social services are available uh, also for Ukrainian uh, women uh, uh, with, uh, with children. And that, uh, that means that uh, community-based activities are uh, open for them as well. In these municipalities uh, where we, we have uh, more refugees uh, from Ukraine, we have uh, special activities for them as well. And uh, um, it's important that uh, NGOs, uh, local NGOs, are very active to provide uh, uh, support. And we try to, uh, to ask them uh, to, uh, to find out if, if there might be also victimization and uh, possible uh, sexual uh, victimization. What I uh, would like to uh, say to you to conclude, uh, this is not only a question of uh, a specialist who are working uh, with, uh, with victims. This is uh, awareness of uh, our population, awareness of uh, very various type of service provider who uh, meet uh, uh, possible victims uh, in their uh, everyday uh, work. We um, uh, need to learn how to recognize the victims and, uh, and inform uh, victims aid or crisis centers or uh, women's um, uh, shelters to help uh, uh, them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear the applause. Now, Um, I, I just uh, <laughs> received a request from our Latvian colleague who needs to leave very soon. And by the way, Minister of Foreign Affairs also apologized. He has a meeting also with the Latvian delegation, so he had to leave our discussion earlier. So uh, there was a, a bit of a change in the schedule. So now I'd like to invite uh, Diana Jakaite, Deputy State Secretary of the Ministry of Welfare of Latvia, May I ask uh, very short remarks, five minutes, because we are hopelessly behind the schedule. <laughs> Thank you. I will try my best, and unfortunately, I have to catch my bus back home to Riga. <laughs> so that's why I asked this opportunity to, to uh, have my intervention a bit earlier, uh, because we have a very great uh, cooperation, example of cooperation between Latvian government, uh, go governmental organizations, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Welfare, together with NGOs, uh, NGO particularly one, NGO Marta Center and the NGO in Ukrainian side and municipalities in Ukraine to cooperate to build up the services for victims suffering from sexual violence in the conflict zones. And uh, when the Russian Federation started uh, the war, Latvia set several priorities, including uh, uh, to build support for victims of sexual violence, ensure consultations for civil civilians and support uh, the, doc, to document war crimes, which is very, very important, as we heard uh, it already. And Latvian Mart, uh, NGO, Martis Center, uh, they has a long uh, uh, history of cooperation with municipalities in Western Ukraine. 
And uh, in the early days of full-scale war, it was important to assure that Latvia gives uh, the necessary support for our partners to provide the assistance for civilians. And uh, specialists from NGO Marta Center started to provide uh, emotional support to residents of Eastern Ukraine in cooperation with other Latvian crisis center. And uh, the help uh, received, it provided the opportunity for Ukrainian women find psychological resources to introduce the changes in their life. For example, uh, they were motivated uh, to move to safer regions because we know that uh, Ukrainian uh, civilians, they tend to uh, be in their homes because they have born there and they want to stay in their home. But uh, there were situations when uh, people had to leave uh, their home just to be in a safer place because uh, in a conflict zone, it was a very great risk that women could be exposed to sexual uh, violence because we know that Russian armies are using this weapon. So, um, uh, so, and in November 2020, a Latvian NGO Center Marta together with the Ukrainian NGO Elios Ukraina opened a rehabilitation center in Ivano uh, Frankivsk, where uh, up to 30 women can stay in the rehabilitation center at the same time, where they can uh, receive the shelter, social, psychological, judicial, and medical assistance, uh, everything in one place. And of course, a team of specialists were trained to give this support to women. And also the hotline was started, which was very important. This hotline was uh, uh, made for those who uh, suffer from sexual crimes and torture, which, which provides, and this uh, helpline provided counseling and psychological help. That was very important to establish such a hotline. Uh, and of course, uh, we also, uh, Latvia, uh, we, we also are uh, in the framework of Ukraine reconstruction. Latvia is engaged in Chernihiv region. And there also our NGO Martis Center is working closely with local partners. And uh, in this year, two support centers for women will be opened in Chernihiv uh, city and region, which is, we are, we are very proud of this, of course, and we feel that this is real support which we uh, can give to uh, Ukraine civilians. And of course, in these centers, uh, the various types of support for women will be provided. And of course, as I already mentioned, we provide support on docu documenting Russians' war crimes according to international legislation and best practices. Uh, and of course, uh, 520 specialists will, were trained to work with victims documenting war crimes because it's very important how they are working with victims, what kind of uh, uh, things should be documented, uh, how it should be documented. So we invested uh, uh, in this knowledge of the specialists. And in the next years, of course, we will continue to support uh, support uh, Ukraine for and uh, uh, for renewal of local action plans, women, peace and security. And one thing which I wanted to mention is also to create the integrated model of uh, Transcarpathian region to provide assistance to war victims, especially victims of social, uh, sexual violence. Of course, there will be also training of all specialists dealing with the uh, war victims. And uh, I agree very much that sexual violence is a, is a devastating weapon used by the Russian military against Ukraine and civilians. And every day we receive new stories of inhuman experience from Ukraine. And uh, I agree very much that uh, not, we should talk about this. We, we shouldn't uh, uh, sil be silent about this. And uh, it we should talk in the governmental level and in society level as well, which is very important. And Latvia, this year, uh, Latvian uh, women gathered in front of Russian embassy in a protest action against sexual violence and war crimes in Ukraine. They were partly undressed in blood-stained underwear, their faces were covered and their hands were tied behind their backs. That was a small scale. It was 200 women, 
but still it was uh, it was very very impressive because our society they felt that they should not be silent about this and that was really good and i think that uh, such kind of actions should be continued thank you thank you very much for giving a voice actually to those victims and survivors uh, you know for those uh, nine out of ten who will remain silent and i very much feel that you know what we are doing here we are actually uh, you know, uh, voicing their concerns. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now I'd like to invite uh, our uh, Minister of uh, Social Security and Labor, Monika Navitskiene, online. I know that uh, she would uh, very much uh, like to join us uh, here live, but uh, because of a very contagious uh, COVID illness, she has to uh, stay isolated. Monica, the floor is yours, if possible, under five minutes, uh, because uh, there are urgent questions in the audience. <laughs> I'm gonna do my best. Thank you so much, Inga. Well, it's the last day of my uh, isolation, so I'm very much willing to to leave my apartment. So uh, thank you once again. Um, it is a very big opportunity, I think, for us, exceptional opportunity to have so many stakeholders at this roundtable discussion. And Baltic countries, uh, uh, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, with our different practices, UN special representative, and what is the, the most important, the Ukrainian minister and dear Oksana and member of La Rada Larissa, it's very important for us to understand the better the needs in real time of what kind of support and solutions are needed most. And I think this is a very big possibility and opportunity for us. Um, sexual violence in uh, in the context of war is a form of military aggression. We all agree on that. And Russia deliberately uh, employs sexual violence as a tactic of war. The United Nations Expert Commission uh, uh, has uh, confirmed sexual crimes committed by Russian armed forces in, in Ukraine. And the primary challenge in conflict zones are impunity and the hidden nature, the latency of, uh, of, of, of these crimes. In the international conference held in London in November 2022, we together with our partners agreed to protect the rights of survivors of violence and support their access to justice. Uh, very important to note that not only women and girls, but also men, boys and elderly are vulnerable to sexual violence, often intentionally used as a weapon of war and sexual and gender based violence is one of the most common crimes committed in armed conflicts uh, worldwide since the beginning of uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine, Lithuania has welcomed over 80,000 uh, war refugees. To this day, we have 51,000 war refugees with temporary residence permits, with uh, 34,000 of them being women, uh, which accounts uh, for 64%. Uh, additionally, 29,000 have entered the labor market. There are 10,000 minors with temporary residence permits in, in Lithuania. And Ukrainian refugees since the beginning of Russia's aggression against Ukraine have access to services for survivors of violence, just like any Lithuanian citizen. Lithuania um, continues to combat stigma through various media campaigns and creates conditions for comprehensive health, psychological, and emotional support services. Lithuania has identified uh, through the NGOs uh, 65 cases of migrant women who have experienced and survived sexual abuse between 22 and 23, 35 Ukrainian women. Of course, it is believed that it's only a small reflection of overall problem. The Center of Combating Trafficking in Human uh, Beings and Exploitation is uh, collaborating with the Ministry of Social Security and Labor, is implementing a project entitled Comprehensive Assistance to Ukrainian Victims of Sexual Violence. So One-stop shop assistance is provided to refugees from Ukraine, uh, potential survivors of sexual violence. The assistance includes a 24-hour hotline, social and psychological counseling, legal, medical, and material assistance uh, 
to those women who need it the most. And the project brings together professionals from the Lithuanian public and non-governmental sectors uh, who provide support to victims of sexual violence. Uh, Lithuania could offer Ukraine its experience in the field of protection from prevention of sexual violence. Representatives of NGOs that have been working in this field for many years can share their accumulated knowledge, expert insights, and uh, uh, their experience. Uh, I appreciate the activities of civil society organizations aimed of, um, at assisting uh, Ukrainian war refugees who have suffered from sexual violence. I uh, also com mm, commend the uh, efforts of so the survivors themselves in preventing conflict-related sexual violence, and I'm delighted to hear about the projects of Lithuanian and governmental organizations that we have learned about in today's discussion, and of course, from the colleagues from Latvia, Estonia, and Poland. Uh, I already mentioned the international campaign Rape is a War Crime, uh, aimed at encouraging people who have experienced uh, uh, or know about sexual violence due to the war in Ukraine to anonymously report uh, war crimes. Publicity is the best possible response to the atrocities uh, committed by the aggressor Russia. Uh, survivors, of course, must uh, receive uh, help and support and perpetrators must be brought to justice. But to achieve this, we must coordinate our efforts, coordinate our actions to prevent um, conflict-related sexual violence and the break culture of impunity. People who commit uh, sexual crimes must not uh, escape accountability. It's our shared responsibility to ensure that survivors of sexual violence can seek justice and I'm delighted that the countries of Baltic region and Ukraine uh, can fear best practices here and cooperate to break this wall of silence. I hope that today's discussion will help to create a platform for experts and civil society representatives from neighboring countries to further share best practices on how to ensure effective protection. And maybe perhaps we could consider having a permanent periodic expert group on the exchange of good practices and combating sexual violence, discussing administrative mechanisms that were mentioned that could be needed in the format of Baltic region. So that would be my very fast and short, I hope, intervention. And uh, wish to wish to hear all the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Inga. Thank you very much, Monika Navitskene. I'm very grateful for your personal attention and uh, interest in uh, these matters, in these questions, and all the kind of personal initiative uh, to invite uh, Ms. Patton to Lithuania and to bring together the regional partners to uh, cooperate and try to uh, address uh, also, not at the national level, but try to have some solutions on, on international level, how to deal with uh, uh, these crimes. And now I'd like to invite His Excellency Ambassador of the Republic of Poland here in Lithuania, Konstanty Radzivil. Um, again, I, I kindly ask uh, to have very, very uh, short comments, uh, if you may, especially on your area of expertise, maybe international cooperation on this question. Thank you very much once more. As I already said, war in Ukraine, and I think this is the, 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 most, uh, the most important thing that war in Ukraine related sexual violence can't be treated as inevitable byproduct of war. It is a cra war crime, and all the perpetrators, both individual soldiers, rapists, as, as uh, their leaders, must be brought to justice. And this is our, our uh, common task. The Polish authorities are aware that the Ukrainian refugees, in, main, uh, in fact mainly women, girls and children, are especially vulnerable to human trafficking, forced labor and sexual exploitation. A special bill adopted by the parliament just 20 days after the outbreak of the full-scale Russian aggression provides for protection of the refugees in terms of human trafficking threat. This bill foresees more severe punishment for the crimes related to human trafficking. 
several institutions, including Interior, Justice, and Family and Social Affairs Ministries, established procedures for minor foreigners crossing the Polish border. Uh, the coordination team for the counter human trafficking is cooperating with the national police headquarters, the border guard, non governmental institutions, and regional administration for counter human trafficking. These institutions introduced special procedures for the police and other law enforcement bodies how to identify potential victims of human trafficking, specially trained officers has been assigned to border crossing points and reception points for refugees. There are also procedures to verify persons declaring assistance for the refugees in order to minimize threats of abuse. The, uh, the National Intervention and Consultation Center for the Human Trafficking Victims provides support and pr protection for such persons. It is run by, by NGOs such as La Strada and Pomoc Association on behalf of the Polish authorities. The center runs 24 uh, hours for seven days hotline provides for crisis intervention, safe accommodation and reintegration assistance. It also consults state and local government institutions dealing with the human trafficking victims. The state institutions and NGOs issued dedicated leaflets in Ukrainian language on how to avoid the human trafficking threat. And I must say that uh, as a former governor of the biggest Polish region of Mazovia, I finished my my post uh, in March this year. Uh, I was directly responsible of the management of this huge wave of the refugees, sometimes more than 5,000 daily coming to Warsaw, only to Warsaw, to the region, not to Poland, uh, and the organization of more than 600 refugee centers. Uh, for the uh, Ukrainians in the region. I'd like to assure you that all these provisions I mentioned uh, um, were really implemented with constituency and practiced in all possible dimensions like information, healthcare, psychological care, social care, uh, material support, education for all children, legal uh, advice and support, security, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you very much. And without any delay, then I'm inviting our next speaker, Irmantas Michelonis, uh, Deputy Prosecutor General of Lithuania. As uh, you've heard, there are a lot of issues concerning the legal processes, and actually uh, a lot of responsibility li lies in the hands of the prosecutors and police, how they uh, treat the cases, how they uh, uh, implement the, the procedures without the re traumatization and kind of with the, the least possible additional harm to the survivors. Uh, if uh, you may also very short comments. Thank you. Uh, my presentation will be in Lithuanian. First, I want to thank the government of Delvauti in this region. The Tiesų Prokuror is the General Prokuror. I would like to talk about this practical problem with which we are in the Lietuvos Prokuratura and Lietuvos Teisės Augos Institucijos. First, I would like to talk about the fact that the Lietuvos Lietuvos Respublikos General Prokuratura was in the first day of the year of the year of the year of Ukraine. Kovo pirmą dieną jau pradėjo iki teisminė tyrimą dėl nusikaltimų žmoniškumų ir karo nusikaltimų. Ir kaip žinia, seksualiniai nusikaltimai padaryti karo agresijos kontekste taip pat gali būti laikomi nusikaltimų žmoniškumui. Lietuvoje buvo sudaryta labai didelė iki teisminio tyrimo pareigūnų grupė, kuriai buvo pavesta atlikti šį iki teisminę tyrimą. Tai buvo atraukti ir Lietuvos prokurorai, finansinių nusikaltimų tarnybos pareigūnai, policijos pareigūnai. 
Kitą dieną, kai buvo pradėtas iki teisminis tyrimas, Lietuva inicijavo, padedant Eurojustui koordinacinį pasitarimę Eurojustai, kuri buvo pakvestos visos Europos Sąjungos valstybės ir buvo tariamas į kokiu būdu reikėtų atsakyti tą agresiją, kurią ištiko Ukraina. Tai buvo nutarta steikti jungtinę tyrimo grupę. Ir jau kovo 25 dienas buvo sudaryta jungtinė tyrimo grupė, kurie įėjo Lietuva, Lenkija ir Ukraina. Vėliau prie jungtinės tyrimo grupės prisijungė kitos Europos Sąjungos valstybės, tai Latvija, Estija, Slovakija, Rumunija, kas yra unikalu, tai prie tų metų balandžio 25 dieną, taip pat prie jungtinės tyrimo grupės prisijungė tarptautinis baudžiamasis teismas. Kuo yra unikali Lietuva, lyginant su kitomis Europos Sąjungos ir pasaulio valstybėmis? Lietuva turi tvirtintą būdžiamajame kodekse universalios jurisdikcijos principą. Ar tas principas yra labai plačiai suprantamas, lyginant su kitomis pasaulio valstybėmis. Ir šitas principas leidžia Lietuvai persekioti užsienio piliečiaus. Tai yra ne Lietuvos Respublikos piliečiaus už karo nusikaltimus ir nusikaltimus žmoniškų padarytus ne Lietuvos Respublikos teritorijoje. Kitos valstybės net ir turėdamos įtvirtintą tokį universalios jurisdikcijos principą turi labai daug apribojimų. Sakykime, gali vykdyti persiokėjimą tik tais atvejais, kai jų valstybė, jų jurisdikcijoje yra įtariamasis, arba kai nuo nusikaltimų nukentėjo jų šalies piliečiai. Taip pat Lietuva yra unikali ir kita prasme. Lietuvoje yra atvirtintas procesas į napsentę, tai galima vykdyti baudžiamą į persiokėjimą ir tų asmenų ažvalių, kurie nėra Lietuvos jurisdikcijoje. Lietuvos jurisdikcijoje nėra pasiekėmi. Taigi, tai yra irgi unikalus bruožas, kuo Lietuva skiriasi nuo kitų pasaulio ir Europos valstybių. Ir kaip gerosios praktikos pavyzdys yra 21 metų sausio 13 byla. Taigi, kaip Lietuvoje, kaip ir yra visos galimybės tą baudžiamą įpersiekimą dėl karo nusikaltimų ir nusikaltimų žmoniškumui vykdyti. Kokia situacija buvo, kai buvo pradėtas iki teisminis tyrimas prie tais metais dėl karo nusikaltimų? Iš tikrųjų, mes buvome tuo metu pakankamai naivus, matydami tūkstančius pabėgalių tiek Lietuvoje, tiek Europoje, mes tikėjome, kad karo nusikaltimo aukos tiesiog užplūsti sėsaugos institucijos, norėdamos pasidalinti savo turimais išgyvenimais, turimais rodimais apie tai, kas vyksta Ukrainoje. Tačiau realybė buvo visiškai kitokia ir nepaisant tų tūkstančių pabėgalių, kurie užplūsti Lietuvą, kitas Europos Sąjungos valstybės, iš esmės į tai sėsaugos institucijas kreipisi tik tai pavieniai asmenis, norėdami suteikti tam tikrą informaciją. Ir Lietuva nebuvo šioje vietoje įskirti tokia pačia situacija mes stebėjome ir kitose Europos Sąjungos valstybėse. Įdomu modelį galiu pasakyti, kad šiai dienai turime įsidomenėmis tik tai 20 pasaulio valstybių atlieka kitais minėtylimą dėl karo nusikaltimų padarytų Ukrainoje. Lietuva nuo pat pirmų karo dienų sukūrė tinklalapį ripot.e.policija.lt, į kurį pabėgalį galėjo kreipti ir pateikti turimą informaciją, tačiau vėlgi realybė buvo tokia, jog į tą tinklalapį kreipėsi tik tai pavienį asmenis. Tokius tinklalapius buvo sukūrėsios ir kitos Europos Sąjungos valstybės įskaitant ir tarptautinai baužimai teismą. Tačiau vėlgi realybė ta, kad į kitose šalyse iš tikrųjų asmenis pabėgalį buvo pakankamai pavyzdžiai. Taigi, policijai beliko imti sproktyvių veiksmų, policija kartu su migracijos tarnyba siekia identifikuoti tuos asmenius, kurie galimai nukentėja nuo karo nusikaltimų, įskaitant ir seksualinius nusikaltimus. Ir proktyviais veiksmais nustatė tuos galimus nukentėjusius, jis bandė su jais kontaktuoti, jeigu kalbėti apie tam tikrą statistiką, tai Lietuvos policijos pareigūnai pasiekė daugiau nei 5 tūkstančius karo pabėgalių, tai yra tie asmenius, kurie turimom žiniom, jau turėjo tam tikrų dominų apie karo nusikaltimus Ukrainoje. Ir vėlgi statistika yra pakankamai niuri, tik tai vienas iš dešimties Ukrainos pabėgalių sutiko dalyvauti baudžiamajame procese, kaip nukentėjęs. 
Taigi, nepaisant tų problemų, sakykime, rankant, fiksuojant įrodymus, šią dieną baudžiamąjim procesą mes turime daugiau kaip šimtą asmenų nukentėjusių nuo karo nusigaltimų. Tai yra tie asmenys, kurie buvo identifikuoti kaip nukentėję Lietuvoje. Dėja situacija yra tokia, kad neturime šią dieną ne vieno asmens, kuris būtų nukentėjęs nuo seksualinių nusigaltimų Ukrainoje. Realybė yra pakankamai niuri, lyginant su tą, sakykime, informaciją, kurią mes matome viešoje erdvėje, kiek galimų, sakykim, seksualinio nuskaltimo aukų galėtų būti, sakykim, tiek Lietuvoje, tiek kitose valstybėse. Kokios gitos priežastis, kodėl asmenys iš tikrųjų vengia kreiptis į teisės augos instituciją ir dalintis tais įrodymais, tomižinėmis, tais savo išgyvenimais, kurie kas liečia, sakykim, Ukrainos įvykius. Tai mano kaip praktiko, ko geros sakymas būtų tas, ir tai jau nuskambėjo, ko geros šiandien ne vieno pranešėjo metu, tai vis dėl to nepasitikėjamas teisės augos institucijomis, kalbėdamas apie nepasitikėjamą teisės augos institucijom, aš turiu minį ne tik Lietuvos teisės augos institucijas, bet ko gero ir Ukrainos, ir kitų, tiek Europos Sąjungos valstybių, tiek kitų pasaulio valstybių ir taip pat baimės. Ir tos baimės iš tikrųjų galėtų būti, gali būti pagristos, gali būti nepagristos. Jeigu kalbame apie tas iš tikrųjų pagristas baimės, tai tai... Tai, kas, sakykim, pavyko užfiksuoti bendraujant su Ukrainos pabėgėliais. Nemažai Ukrainos pabėgėliai yra atvykę į Lietuvą ir kitas Europos Sąjungos šalis iš okupuotų teritorijų. Vieniems pavyko ištrūkti iš okupuotų teritorijų, kitiems ne. Ir nemaža dalis pabėgėlių giminaičių šiuo metu dar yra, sakykim, tiek okupuotose teritorijose, tiek tiek Rusijos federacijos jurisdikcijoje. Ir iš tikrųjų yra reali grėsmė, jog davus tam tikrus parodymus arba sutikus bendradarbiauti su teisės augos institucijomis, tam tikros grėsmės gali kilti tiems ar tiems asmenims, kurie gyvena okupuotose teritorijose. Nepaisant to, Lietuvos teisės saugos institucijos, kaip ir kiti jungtinės tyrimo grupės nariai įmasi visų veiksmų siekinti identifikuoti nukentėjusius asmenis ir mes matome, Viena, sakykime, labai efektyvų kelia, kaip kaip iš tikrųjų galėtų situaciją keisti šitoje srityje, tai būtent nevyriausybinės organizacijos ir stiprios nevyriausybinės organizacijos, kurie galėtų būti tie pirmi kontaktiniai asmenys, įtikinant asmenys bendradarbiauti su teisės augos institucijomis ir teikiant tam tikrą psichologinę pagalbą. Be stiprių nevyriausybinių organizacijų, ko gero sėkmės, sakykime, šitoje... Kovoje su tokio pobažio nusikaltimais, ko gero, yra be prasme. Taigi, bendradarbiavimas su nevyriausybinėm organizacijom, ko gero, parama nevyriausybinėm organizacijom, nevyriausybinėm organizacijom bendradarbiavimas su teisės saugos institucijom, ko gero, yra tas kelias, kuris galėtų būti sėkmė, sakykime, į tolesnį baudžiamą persekimą. Thank you very much for very open and insightful uh, comments. Uh, let's move on without uh, the delay to our last uh, speaker, that is Daria Rosokhota. Uh, she is a specialist at the analytical center of a Ukrainian NGO uh, called uh, Yurfem. Uh, Daria, we can see you and hopefully we can hear you. Uh, if you can, very shortly, Please uh, um, give your uh, comments. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I will do my best. It's a great pleasure to be a part of this conference and have an opportunity to intervene among honorable panelists. Uh, I will try to finalize to, as soon as possible. So actually, we wanted to raise the question that you have raised to today's conference. It's how can we ensure an effective protection assistance and prevention system for survivors of CRSV? And we decided to find answers on this question through some problematic issues. Uh, the first issue which we wanted to cover is uh, a lack of understanding of legal peculiarities regarding obtaining legal aid, about reparations, etc. Uh, as lawyers, we do know what to do. Actually, we discuss everywhere in the conference, different platforms, etc. But actually, not all survivors, they know what everything about that. Uh, one of the survivors told to us that she filed a lawsuit, for example, to the European Court of Human Rights, but a lot of women and men, they don't know how to do it. 
um, we did see social ads and other activities from the government side and civil society side, but still there are people that have no idea how the system is working. So it's important to us to create a space where people will know where and when it's possible to get help, legal and psychological aid. Um, we can see uh, that our government and our social uh, civil society, they try to inform people, but we have to uh, look for new ways of communication as well and how we can share this space of communication. And what is more important, we have to remember that NGOs, they can't completely replace the state. So uh, for that, we have to concentrate on further cooperation between the state government and uh, NGO sector. Uh, the second issue, uh, we see that uh, active investigation of CRSV cases, they are after, they concentrated more after uh, 24th of February, uh, the last year, but little attention is paid to the investigation of CRSV cases that took place since 2014. Uh, so actually, if we can find information in international reports about cases of CRSV, and it's not one or two cases, we presume that there are quite a lot as well. But at the same time, we see more attention focused on the survivors from uh, 24th February uh, 222. So if we're sharing actually this information, we raise awareness of people. We have to emphasize that it's important to talk that survivors from uh, survivors of CRSV from 2014, they also have an opportunity to go to state authorities, to go to NGOs and uh, other state uh, authorities and to talk about that, to get a psychological aid and legal aid as, uh, as well. From our side, from Ukrainian Women Lawyers Association, UFAM, we have launched a social video where we pointed out that survivors can apply for help even if they suffered from CRSV after 2014. Uh, the first, uh, one of the main points which we wanted to cover um, is a lack of information to citizens uh, of occupied territories about CRSV. Uh, people in the occupied territory, they don't have full information about what is CRSV, how to recognize it actually, uh, what are the forms of CRSV, how to protect yourself and what kind of risks and algorithm of actions uh, they can actually can do. Uh, we do understand it is quite hard to share this information on the occupied territories, but we have to think... Um, exactly about the ways of communication and what our people uh, can do because they actually need it. And the fourth, but uh, last but not least point, which uh, we wanted to cover, it's uh, when, com when people committing suicide, actually we talk about survivors who suffered from CRSV. Uh, we have heard from our uh, attorneys law about this issue that they have no... Um, opportunity to bring into legal frame these cases when survivors of CRSV, they committing actually suicide because uh, they have a psychological trauma, they can't live with these uh, obstacles, etc. Uh, but the survivor, if we talk about survivor sanctuary approach, um, we talk about more about proper help to people who suffer from CRSV. Um, and despite the terrible consequences of CRSV and strong international support, uh, from preventing it and prevention frameworks in place are uh, still somewhat limited uh, in addressing the downstream mental health effects on individuals and communities. We do see available international practices uh, and they don't go into details about the procedure for proving a link between suicide and CRSV. In fact, more international CRSV prevention frameworks they may acknowledge the risk of suicide among survivors, but they do not address suicide uh, prevention strategies. Um, so actually, we talk here about more uh, psychological aid that can prevent this kind of cases. And what can we do? The first is create a safe space that enables survivors to disclose their experience, actually, if they wish to do it. The second is to respond to such disclosure. Uh, in a way that promotes to survivors' safety and capacity to cope. Uh, the third is to respect survivors' wishes and decisions. And the fourth, it supports survivors in seeking further assistance with their need.
And to conclude, uh, we wanted uh, to, we'd like to emphasize that uh, ensuring uh, that insuring is possible and has to build on three main pillars. The first is rising awareness among people. It doesn't matter what the territory occupied or it's not occupied or deliberated territories to look for new ways of communication uh, to show the social videos and social ads. Uh, amendments, international legislation, and building proper infrastructure for survivors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daria. Uh, it was really very useful. Thank you. Before my own uh, few conclusions, I, uh, I saw that there were urgent questions in the audience. Uh, uh, maybe we can uh, take the questions, at least a few of them. Yes, please. in the field of uh, women's human rights, human rights and combating violence against women. And as a part of our solidarity work with uh, Ukrainian NGOs, we have uh, solidarity meetings and we are in a close cooperation with them through WAVE, Women Against Violence Europe, the international network. So I would like just to take this opportunity uh, to, you know, to share their position on all that nice talks that we have heard here and they they ask us just to to spread the word because many times there was an emphasis on ngos but so i i have to trust my colleagues those international money do not reach women's organizations everybody wants as they say to work with the government and you know there is a huge corruption there and so uh, Gongos flourish, governmental, non-governmental organizations, and those who are real experts, and even they have international awards for their work, internationally recognized organizations, but they say they have nothing. They were dealing with a huge amount of work, people who are displaced, people who are coming back from European Union because they haven't received uh, some, what we expected to, to receive there. And so those both flows from the east of the country and from the west, from those other countries, are all on those few women who are carrying all that burden. And they say, and I must believe them, that no, you, no international money reaches them. So maybe, as we have here, the extinguished report your on uh, of United Nations on that issue. Maybe you can do some efforts to navigate those money to those who need them most, who assist real people, and somehow to, to make that, you know, as you, as you mentioned, monitoring system, how to support the women on the ground. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I know it is a sensitive uh, question, and uh, if uh, Ms. Uh, Patton may try no. to address it. <laughs> Listen, I, this is a concern that NGOs raise everywhere, uh, that we all uh, know the, the kind of solid work that NGOs do, and, and I value uh, the work of NGOs, uh, but my office, I don't give money to government and I cannot give money to NGOs. My money goes into a multi-partner trust fund and I do not have a programmatic mandate. I uh, work through the UN country team. So my money is channeled directly to UN agencies to do the, the, the work on the ground, but they partner with NGOs. And I, I am not able to tell you which NGO, but they partner, whether it is UN Women or UNFPA or UNICEF, or w, they all work with, so these UN agencies with whom I am working, whom I am funding for this big catalytic project, they are working with NGOs on the ground. But for my part, because I really hear you and, and I think it's a very legitimate concern that you are conveying to us, uh, I always advocate for, for, donor, for the donor community 
to give money directly to NGOs uh, and 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 uh, to, to to fund the work of NGOs. And and I am seeing because increasingly uh, I am seeing some countries, some some donor countries doing that. Uh, I'm also engaging with the private sector, and I was in Paris like. Uh, three weeks ago and they were talking about giving money not to government not to the UN but to the NGOs directly and I was very pleased to I was very pleased to uh, uh, to to hear that uh, but you can count on me I come I have a civil society background myself uh, and uh, before I joined the UN in 2017 and you can count on me to advocate for for uh, for funding uh, NGOs, especially grassroots uh, uh, organi organizations. Thank you very much. And I'm very sorry to keep you in this room still for a few more minutes, uh, because uh, I have been told that Larissa Bilogir, member of the parliament, also wants to uh, comment on this question if we may hear. Yes, uh, dear friends, uh, this is a very important issue uh, that was raised. Uh, and actually, I, w I want to tell you that the government of Ukraine is paying to the... I didn't see, I didn't he hear completely the issue, uh, the, the question, but I think it's uh, uh, according to the internally displayed persons and the persons that uh, uh, are returning. So in Ukraine, uh, it is... Uh, $50 uh, dollars a person and I think more than $70 uh, for a child each year, uh, each year of months, the government pays to internally displaced uh, persons uh, that uh, are within uh, uh, Ukraine. And actually the UN also paid money the first uh, three months. It was only for three months. Um, uh, but uh, it uh, was uh, the pro program and everybody internally displaced uh, persons uh, did receive this money also. So it's very good to continue such a thing because they are lacking uh, resources uh, because you can imagine these people without the uh, homes and uh, uh, left alone without, uh, the, 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 without work. And as to NGO, it's a good, good idea because we have thousands of NGOs that were created in Ukraine and they are very proactive and they if they would receive money if Ukrainian NGOs they would do a lot and we would multiply this uh, effect thank you very much thank you thank you for your comments uh, to the question to add that uh, when it, what she mentioned about uh, UN giving money, I mean, like uh, there are agencies like UNHCR dealing with refugees, but also UNICEF uh, giving cash assistance. But the cash assistance, I was, I was in Poland, I was in Moldova, and I was in Ukraine, where they had the blue dot. They, so UNHCR and UNICEF working together, and the cash assistance goes directly to the to the beneficiaries to the families but i think uh, the lady here raised something very different she she she's not talking about uh, cash assistance i think she's talking about ngos uh, b b funding to ngos as opposed to to, to 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 government but from the perspective of the un i mean like uh, uh, like i said the un uh, agencies work through uh, through the NGOs uh, in uh, in in the country, and uh, I have no influence on uh, on 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 donors who decide to uh, to to give to uh, what proportion of money goes to the government and what proportion goes to NGO goes to the UN. But I have been advocating for uh, for not just for Ukraine, for, for every other, for all the countries falling within the purview of mandate, of my mandate. I have been promoting the work of NGOs, the solid work that they do on the ground as first responders and, and, and the, 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 the critical need to adequately fund them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Patton. Let me conclude this uh, discussion and the seminar on a few positive notes. 
uh, although it's hard to find any positivity in, in all this suffering. Uh, we've heard a lot of problems, you know, the, the gap between the actual numbers of sexual violence and reported uh, cases and investigated cases and even less convictions. Uh, there are multiple problems with the enforcement of the existing norms. You know, there are some norms, there, there are uh, the Security Council resolutions, there, there are conventions that are supposed to, uh, uh, to prohibit and to punish sexual violence in the conflict zones. There, there are problems with the implementation, there are problems with the enforcement. Uh, states, countries can do a lot to improve the current uh, enforcement of those norms. But also, I think there must be some space and some opportunities also for kind of rethinking the whole mechanism, mechanism the, the whole area probably. Uh, we, we have those uh, norms in, in different uh, conventions and documents. A lot of them are soft law norms. They are kind of uh, recommendations, they, they push, they recommend, they argue, but then leave a lot of discretion for different countries to do it and sometimes you achieve results, sometimes you don't. And that's that's the, also the characteristic of international law, how it works, and also international relations and politics. But also, maybe we, you know, uh, we uh, have to start thinking, and maybe Ukraine is, uh, you know, a case, as you said, a lachmus case, uh, to reform the area, to reform the field. Maybe we do need a completely new convention specifically targeting the uh, the sexual violence uh, in the conflict zones maybe with that uh, additional publicity and recognition it could kind of uh, change the attitudes also you know uh, in the society and in the uh, legal institutions and i see uh, pramila is shaking her hand, <laughs> head uh, so uh, and she is not allowing me to end on, on the optimistic note <laughs> <laughs> I'll be glad to continue the discussion over the coffee and I want to give uh, uh, probably the, the opportunity for Minister Monika Navitskiene to actually uh, to close the, the discussion and the seminar if uh, she is uh, still online. I am, I am online and uh, happy to hear all, all the interventions and the conclusions. I would be very happy to have coffee with you. <laughs> But I will catch up. <laughs> we'll see from I go on Wednesday. But on today's short thing, the only thing that I would like to add is that we must continue this work uh, with uh, mm, with new convention or without. Uh, but just to to continue to work together and uh, to to coordinate our actions, I think those administrative mechanisms that could be more united and uh, more tackling the the problems that was uh, was um, expressed by our our colleagues from Ukraine, and I am also thinking about the uh, permanent format. Uh, uh, that could be from Baltic countries, uh, uh, together with our colleagues from Ukraine, working on specific this specific issue. And I think that we could we I would conclude uh, I conclude on on that maybe. But of course, uh, I think it's it was a very successful event. And thank, thank you so much, Inga, for moderating it. Thank you all the thank you all the participants that uh, that dedicated your time and efforts uh, in these discussions. So, Thank you so much. Thank you, Monica. Thank you for your patience. Uh, and uh, thank you for my uh, um, panel speakers for, for your time, for your dedication to this issue. And uh, uh, let's uh, see the next time during other opportunities to discuss um, these issues. Thank you.